Tying a boat uh, to a mooring ball can be sometimes challenging, especially if you don't have uh, these cleats, which are additional, that's what we put, they're not original. So usually what, uh, I don't really know how Lagoon thinks that, and most of the catamarans, how do you supposed to tie uh, to a buoy? So there's one way, you can use uh, this cleat and then go via this pulley, you see? But then the boat is not stable, this is good only for very low winds. When you have more winds, you want to have this so-called Y. And because you have two ropes, the boat is very stable, you know, because like if you look at the monohull, the monohull would be, you know, just one line and then swinging left and right a lot, which catamarans don't because they have uh, these two lines, which is really good. So much more stable on the, on, the, on the buoy. Also on the anchor, the same thing. For the anchor, you just use this rope, so you attach this to the, to the chain, and you have again the same thing, this Y, you know, holding the boat, you know, very stable upwind, it's not going left and right like a monohull, because when you go left and right, you get much bigger forces, you know, the boat gets here, it pulls the anchor, you know, because the side of the boats are getting more exposed to the wind, so much more force uh, to the anchor. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that these ropes, see we have one rope going here, and there's another rope going there, which is just perfect. But then if we wouldn't have these cleats, then I guess we would have to put it on this one. Now the problem is that then the rope goes, you see, around the boat, and it's, you know, scratching the hull and that's crazy noises inside. Basically impossible to sleep. Now, some people then try to solve the problem and going from here across here, but look at all these wires, you know, it just doesn't work. Another thing is when you put the rope here and then there's no wind, the rope tends to fall down and goes under the boat and then the anti-fouling gets uh, scratched. So I would really, really like to hear from the lagoon how do you suppose to tie this boat to the, to the buoy uh, without having these cleats? And why don't they make these cleats? You know, maybe we did something wrong, maybe they're gonna be pulled out, but I think this is a really good solution and it's working uh, really well. Now, another thing is the angle, you see, so how far this rope should be. Now, if there's a lot of wind, you want to have them very long. So it's all about the angle. You don't want to have, so there's a concrete block, and then there's a rope that goes up to the buoy. So if this is the buoy, so further down there in the water, there's a huge concrete block. Now, if it's very deep water, you don't want to have this angle too steep, you see, pulling the block up, because then the block is much less efficient, and sometimes the block is too small, so you're just gonna pull the whole block and, you know, go away. So you want to have a very, you know, like low angle, and that's to achieve by letting these ropes out a lot, especially in strong winds. So we're actually having, we're actually sheltered, but out there in the channel, you can see there's very strong winds. Uh, so that's why we also prepared our boat for strong winds here, but luckily we're, you know, protected by the islands. So you see there is now no force. Also having very long ropes, you see they're kind of stretchy. And then when you get force, you see right now pulling the boat. And this is a good sign, if the buoy goes under the water, that's a very good sign that this angle is, you know, very low. And the longer the ropes, the more stretch you have, you know, the less force you get on these guys. Also, if right now we would have a buoy here uh, in the middle, so these ropes would go, you know, very like at, uh, you know, very small angle here, the buoy is here. Uh, then if you look at the forces, you see there's very little force pulling the boat forward, and that means the forces are very high. So the more further out you put the buoy, the longer these ropes, uh, the more gentle you are to the cleats and the ropes, uh, the closer you put the buoy, the more stress you're putting on the ropes and the cleats, because this angle, you see, it's not so efficient. So now another trick I did tonight is, you never know, these buoys break, and there's no guarantee. We paid for this buoy, but there's no, no insurance, so if the buoy breaks, it's, you know, our, our problem. Now, if the buoy breaks, you know, and there's very strong wind, you're gonna be out, you see, uh, in a couple minutes and you're sleeping, you're probably not going to know. So what I did is, we were here around 4 meters deep, and I just dropped the anchor, you see, like 10 meters. Just enough, you know, that if the buoy breaks, it's going to start making noises and it's going to wake me up and also, you know, you know, hold the boat a little bit, uh, you know, to not be so fast on the rocks. So that's why sometimes having an anchor, you know, like use your own anchor, is much better because you will drag slowly, so you know, you can wake up during the night and check 
and you'll see that you know you're not holding the anchor usually doesn't just okay in a very deep waters it can but what I'm saying is when the buoy snaps it snaps you see the anchor will kind of you know slow down the, the drift so that's why this is a very good idea so you just drop uh, a little bit you know like twice the depth or something uh, just make sure that the boat is not going to be swinging around because tonight we had this weather forecast and I was sure we we're going to get strong this southeast winds called Yugo in Croatia so that's why I knew the boat's going to stay here but if I was expecting the boat to go around then never do this with the anchor uh, because it's going to you know tangle around and you're going to have uh, even more trouble and when the buoy goes under the water this is a really good sign and also kind of uh, works like uh, you know suspension you know putting everything gentle on the cleats and the ropes uh, looking at this catamaran it's a little bit far so we don't see well uh, but you can see that he puts his lines like from the inside see he's not going around but just goes like directly across as i've showed so it's kind of you know it doesn't really work you know you can break something but it's the only way if you want to sleep in the in the forward cabins and still you're gonna get this rubbing against the hull and then behind you can see a mono hull so then it's, it turns like this and it's kind of swinging in the wind putting excessive forces on the on the anchor but that's how it is So we're having 20 knots of true wind speed uh, going downwind, so the parent twin angle is 170, so it's straight downwind. So on the catamaran, there's not much choices you can do. It's actually sometimes kind of tricky. So what we did is uh, we just opened the, the Genoa, actually a very small jib, which is self-tacking. And because it's self-tacking, we had to put an extra line to get a normal shape. So the original sheet from the Genoa, see we're just kind of not using it right now because it would pull the sail too much in so the shape would be, it would be very, you know, like close. So that's why the self-tacking doesn't work downwind. Uh, but we're lucky that we have this uh, Code Zero setting here. So we're just using now the sheet from the, you know, Code Zero coming here to the winch. And now we're having a pretty good shape. You see, it's pretty okay. Now, why are we not having the big code zero now? Because, uh, well, I guess the true wind maximum speed is around uh, 15 knots. We don't want to force it. Probably we could, you know, open it. It's uh, almost twice the size. But then if you get a big gust, you can break something. We're not racing, so just, you know, going uh, easily. And we're still doing six knots. But in the case, if the winds are going to drop down to 15 knots, then we're going to unfurl uh, the big guy and then we're gonna be actually even faster than now with this uh, small sail. So why are we not having any mainsail? It's because when you go downwind, if you would have both sails, you would have to kind of zigzag left and right. It's a lot of work. And also when you are jibing this sail, there's a lot of force. It's just not easy to, you know, do it. So sometimes it's just the best to go straight downwind. Down there is the Vis Island where we're going and just, you know, you're not going to come with these cruising catamarans much faster if you do zigzag, but just more chances to break something and uh, a lot of work. So it would be actually perfect now if the winds dropped a little bit so that we could use the big uh, uh, code zero and that would give us even more speed. Another thing is if you open the main now and you open it, the, you know, this sail would be in the shade, of course, because the wind you see is going like this. So then this sail would take all the wind and this one wouldn't have anything. So you don't gain much by having uh, two sails. We could do a butterfly, which means wing to wing. So we could open the main on this side and general on that side. That would kind of work. You're a little bit limited, you know, with the direction you can go. So setting a wing to wing does take, you know, a little bit more effort and, uh, and uh, you have to steer very precisely. You know, you cannot go just, you know, any angle, much more limited. But as we're you know, just uh, cruising, we have a decent speed, enough of wind. Uh, we're not racing. This is a really good setting for today. And it's going to bring us safely to the island of Vis. We have around 20 miles, so it's around three and a half hour sail. And it's all about enjoying. It's not always, you know, getting the maximum speed you can get. That's racing. When you're cruising, you do want to have some comfort, safety 
and not cause uh, wear and tear. We're not we're doing around five knots and then when we have a gust we go up to five and a half, up to six. And once we get, so we're now here coming out through the channel and once we get away from the island we'll probably get you know more winds and also more waves which are going to be pushing us and so we'll increase the speed. So we probably should be doing around six uh, which is really good uh, cruising speed having 90 knots of true in speed right now. And the boat feels uh, very stable. It's a very nice cruising day. And you can see behind, see we're not racing but uh, we're moving very, very decently. Great cruising speed. A beautiful sailing day. Many boats coming out of the harbor. Here's the Neil 43 under one reef. Well, he did came in front of us, but he also left uh, 20 minutes ago. So it's going to be interesting to see on the next deck what's going to be his uh, angle. So he's doing the long way, he's zigzagging down and we're just going straight. He has more speed because he has better angle. We are slower, but doing a shorter way. And there's another sailboat here. This one looks super fast, but actually they're using an engine and just a little bit of front sail to help. And yeah, I don't know why. They could easily just open the full sail, turn the engine off and sail nicely. But if you're not comfortable, you know, if you think this is a lot of wind, then yeah, this is the smart way to do, why not? It's not all about just pushing, you know, it's about knowing your limits and gaining experience slowly. This is the wind history, so you can see that the wind dropped a lot. And that's when we put up uh, code zero and then the wind goes up immediately. This is like how it is sailing, you see. Uh, but now we have this uh, big code zero, 100 square meters. Uh, we have apparent wind speed of 12. This is actually the thing you want to look. So no, true wind speed is like 17, 18, which is kind of a lot. But because we're going straight downwind, the apparent wind is uh, pretty low and also because we have a quite good speed so now surfing down to 7.4. So the apparent wind speed is actually what the sail is feeling. So I guess we could push this one up to 15 apparent wind speed, but then definitely um, furl it. So the true wind speed, I guess we can go up to 20, but it's also a lot about, uh, you know, just the feeling and the sea state. Anyway, we're having a much better speed now. The boat is more happy, it's more stable. It's a beautiful sail because earlier, you know, the speed just dropped to three knots, three and a half, but now we're back in the game. So very nice to have this beautiful sail. So this sail is using this, uh, this sheet, that's his sheet and goes up to this winch. Now the only problem on this boat is that, you see, this is the halyard. This is the rope that pulls the sail up to the top of the mast. But, and then it's going downwind, it would be kind of cool to release it a little bit just to get a better shape and also less uh, forces on the rig. Uh, but because I have no stopper for this one now, I cannot use this one here, so which means we would have to furl and then release and open, so it's just a little bit clumsy. But that's how it is, it's not a racing boat, so I'm still happy that we have this sail. So setting uh, code zero, so you can adjust it with a halyard. So when you go more upwind, you want a tension. Uh, when you go downwind, you can, you know, release the halyard a little bit. And then you have this sheet, you see. And then you just try to, you see, get a good shape when going downwind, when going uh, sidewinds and upwind. You're going to look at these telltales, these uh, red things, and you want them, you know, having a nice flow to be parallel and, you know, going backwards. So uh, when we were opening the sail, so option one is that you put engines on and you go full speed forward. So that's how you release the apparent wind speed. Uh, what we did is uh, we didn't start any engines, but we kept the Genova open and then we opened the code zero behind and then furled uh, the Genova. Now the winds just increased, so in a case uh, we want to put this down 
in strong winds you really want to make a shade with the Genoa. So we would open the Genoa first, would make kind of, you know, a shade, wind shade to the code zero, and then it would be much easier to furl it. And if the winds increase a lot, you also want to start engines, go full speed, kind of downwind, to reduce the apparent wind speed. And that would be the best technique, uh, you know, to safely do it. If you would just, you know, do it right now, just furl it, there would be a lot of, you see, force wind in the sail, and you would have a kind of, you know, hard time furling it, you know, putting a lot of force, wouldn't furl nicely, uh, it could get in trouble. So it's a very good technique to use this shade. The same thing you can do also with the spinnakers, sometimes using also the mainsail as a shade. So it doesn't matter which sail you use as long as uh, you just make a shade and then the sail has, you see, no wind and just starts, you know, flapping behind. All the winds have picked up now. We have 20 knots of true in speed, 13 apparent, and we're doing constantly seven knots and more. So we're still good, but then if the winds are going to increase much more, we'll probably have to do something. Here's the history. It's my favorite instrument. So we're going straight down wind almost. This is the true wind direction history in last, this is in the last 10 minutes. And then this is the wind history in the last 10 minutes. And we can actually set this, I just prefer to have it uh, one hour, I don't know why. So let's set it to one hour. So now it's 60 minutes. And then you can see how the wind was going down, 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 down. And exactly here, we decided to put the big sail up and then the wind goes up. You know, it's just like a Murphy's Law. That's how it is. Another important thing is the thickness of the halyard. So this one you see is like a normal decent size. Now many times on some boats they put it uh, very thin. And now it doesn't, you know, even if it's very high quality, the name or wherever, you want to have a very thick one. And then you want to have it double. So you don't see, but actually this uh, halyard, see it goes up and then goes around the sail and back up, it's attached to the mast. So it's actually double line and it's a very thick one and this is really good because otherwise if it's just a single line or a double but much thinner uh, this halyard just tends to work you know just tend to stretch a little bit it's uh, so the mast is 20 meters and then uh, you know just get some movement and then wherever this halyard goes into the mast you can get friction and eventually they fail so it's really important to have oversized halyard and have it double and on many boats, uh, I've seen it, uh, you know, too small. And then we had problems with the friction. So the winds, uh, so even up, they dropped, you know, they came up again a little bit. So we now have, see, 15 apparent wind speed, which is like kind of a limit. Okay, now it's falling down again. But the question is like, you know, how much do you want to push it? You know, how do you know? Uh, what is the limit and there is no uh, easy answer because uh, nobody gives it to you uh, the producers uh, they just kind of want to stay away from this and uh, so basically what uh, Lagoon says is that we shouldn't be doing what we're doing right now they say you should always have a mainsail up and you should never go down with solely on the front sail and I guess especially not with a big uh, code zero in these winds because they say that the mast is not uh, stable now looking at this mast it looks uh, pretty stable to me see there is no you see the halyard is not uh, see like it's kind of a little bit to see kind of soft because we didn't tension uh, you know too much the front edge and I could say, you know, it's a pretty happy boat. And this is how you cross an ocean. These are the winds you're going to get when you're crossing an ocean. And going downwind, this is the only way. Because uh, if you put the main up, say it's not going to work. Uh, there's a problem with the main that starts uh, flapping, especially at lower winds. And of course, you cannot go straight downwind. So you do need, you know, forward sails. And this has been, you know, a discussion for a long time. Uh, about these catamarans and then everybody says uh, oh you're not supposed to sail it like this so how do you supposed to do it then how do you supposed to cross an ocean these are the wind conditions you get and uh, most of the time when you cross an ocean the mainsail is you no know, it's too heavy it's too high 
and it's just banging left and right, you're going to cause wear and tear. You're going to have, uh, you know, kind of low speed. So if you ask me, this is the setting you want to have. And that's also how many people do cross an ocean or with a parasail or just, you know, a code zero. And I think that all these uh, designers of these trimmer of catamarans, they have to design the mass, the rigging that this is going to be normal. And that's what everybody does on the monohulls. Okay, the monohull kind of has this uh, backstay. But then again, the catamaran has this uh, stay say, um, shrouds much more backwards, right? So it's just something that's not exactly clear and seems like the producers are avoiding. Uh, if you ask me, uh, this is okay now. Now, I'm not an expert in this field. It just feels like a happy boat. But yeah, you don't want to push it. But now, really, I want uh, the designers to design these boats for us who are using it. And I want them to make the rig uh, like normal to do this uh, in these wind conditions. And that, I think, is what uh, everybody wants. So the winds are not dropping, going up. So it's time to change uh, the sails. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start the engines, go full speed downwind. Then we're going to open the small jib, uh, make a shade to the code zero and then furl the code zero. Uh, so we have a crew which is not experienced, uh, so something might go wrong, but that's exactly why we're filming this, uh, you know, to find. So I'm going to give a camera now to the camera guy. I'm going to start uh, engines. I still have uh, autopilot on wind. Uh, and I'm going to set it now to 160 apparent wind angle and I'm going to go a lot of speed. So I'm going to go very fast because going fast, because we're going downwind, we're going to feel less wind, which is like lower apparent wind. And also when you use engines in the waves, the boat gets more stable. So it's just, uh, it's um, you know, easier to work on the deck. Uh, so we are now under wind autopilot. We have a lot of uh, throttle. We're going now. I'm going to open uh, the jib here. So the jib is just to make a shade uh, to the code zero, and also to. It would be nice to have a gloves now, but it's okay. I'll just be careful. Now I would want to make a couple of these because uh, there's more uh, forces now with the stronger winds. degrees so now we have a kind of shade uh, so now one crew member has to release the rope as I'm gonna be pulling it in now he has to do just right so I've talked to him and let's hope that uh, this is gonna work and I don't feel much wind now because we really reduced the parent wind speed so it should be uh, pretty easy now Okay, we're now furling it and I'm giving the signs with my head so that he puts uh, more rope, yeah, so we're furling it kind of nicely. And then in the end he has to go a little bit more tight on the rope so we get nice fur. Okay. And a couple of times I put the sheet around and we're good. 
and then I have to make sure that I uh, put enough tension here, otherwise it could open. And these stoppers. And yeah, it was pretty easy to do it now. Although we had quite a lot of winds. But if the method is uh, right, everything is easier. So now we can release uh, a little bit more. And now less power on the engines. So now we're having a couple of passengers feeling a little bit maybe seasick because of these waves. So we just want to get to this, which is here as quick as possible, 10 miles. So we're just going to use both the engines and the sail. We're going to be more stable, we're going to go quicker. Uh, but sometimes when cruising the comfort is just more important than... Uh... Now sailing uh, downwind with the jib and now you can see what I was talking about. You see this shape, see this should be like more open. Uh, but we are not having the, you know, the code zero sheet right now with push going from there. We're just having this uh, self tacking and you can just see that the shape, it doesn't work, you see. Even if the wind was from the side, you know, it would just, wouldn't go nicely through. And now the wind is more from behind. So it just makes sense that you could open the sail much more. And then again, when you look at the top, you can see that it's open too much. So the top is open too much. This is closed too much. So that's why the self-taking is just not good for downwind. Now, if this rail would be much longer all the way to here, it would make a huge difference. So what we would need is uh, this rail much longer, and then maybe the same system as we have for the, and then maybe have a system for like this one for the main sheet, just electric one that you could adjust the angle. Or just have uh, like one road limiter or whatever it would work uh, much better. We are in uh, Vis, Croatia, and this place has a relatively very good buoy uh, for Croatia. So like I've seen in the British Virgin Islands, there's really good buoys, straightforward. But in Croatia, you know, it can be, you're not sure which one you can take, which one not, but okay, this one is like a nice example. And uh, there's plenty of these here, a lot of buoys because it's very deep. You can see all these buoys. Uh, so, what is the thing about the buoy and why are we using free ropes now in complicating our life? So, the buoy, there is a huge concrete block down there, like a very big heavy block. And then the rope goes up and then there is this buoy. And you can see the rope which belongs to the buoy and there's a loop in the end. Now, ideally, you want to put your rope through that loop, but because we saw it's damaged, because the, you know, the rope is rubbing, uh, we decided to put through the small one, which we later found. You see, it's somebody made it because they saw that's, you know, already worn out. Uh, but then uh, we decided also to put it directly through the buoy, uh, just to make it safe, and we left this bad one, you know, why not? We'll just leave it. So we don't need three ropes, you would need just two ropes. Now, important is, where do you connect it? If this buoy would be just a plastic container, you know, not strong enough, you don't want to do what we did, right? You always have to look for the strong attachment and each buoy is different. So we've tied on this one on top because it's a steel that goes through, which is good. Uh, but sometimes you just have to lift the buoy and then go under and connect directly to the rope that comes from the block. So uh, it, there's no straightforward uh, answer how to tie to the buoy, especially in Croatia because they're all different, but just think about put your line to the very strong attachment, you know, sometimes there's a small line uh, Just think, you know, logically, you know, is it gonna hold your boat or no? Now these buoys, they're not bulletproof. Sometimes in strong winds, uh, the buoy would snap So being like here, uh, you don't always feel uh, safe in very strong winds So what you can do is what we've done earlier already. You could drop the anchor uh, Just, you know, like touch the bottom and then if the buoy snaps it's gonna rattle, you know, it's gonna wake you up. We're out now sailing. We are going from this 
to Hvar to my favorite restaurant Arsenal in uh, Uvala Pribinja, which is right here. And before you, when you start the engines, when we were leaving the buoy, there's a very important thing you have to do. So these things are connected with the steel uh, cables or wires, how is it called, cable, to the engine. And it's actually uh, two cables per each because one shifts in a gear and one adds a throttle. Now these cables tend to break. It happened to me already. So it's very important before you're leaving marina, buoy or whatever, when you start the engines, always try forward, backwards. Now, it might look it's working both directions, but you actually have to get thrust forward and thrust backwards. So basically you have to watch the boat and see the boat moving backwards, forward, and then you do the other engine. Because sometimes the cable for the gear breaks and then it stays in the gear. So you're adding throttle forward backwards, which is just throttle, but the gear doesn't shift. So whatever you do, you're just gonna go forward. You cannot go backwards. Now, if the cable of the throttle breaks, then of course you're just gonna be able to put in a gear, but you won't be able to get any throttle. So definitely always when leaving the marina on the buoy, start the engines and just see if you get response you want. So the boat has to go backwards or forward, the same on the other side. We're having now really good conditions. We have 15 knots of true in speed. Uh, the wind is coming from the side, which is uh, what we always want to have. This is the best speed you can get. We're doing 6.7 knots. We were doing 8 recently because we have 20 knots of wind speed. A beautiful sailing day. So what we've done is we have a full main and we have a full Genoa. We have two monohulls behind us racing to catch us. So we are now sailing with the winds from the side. So how do you set a Genoa? You loosen this a little bit and then you want to get these telltales straight, which are not right now. Maybe the upper one is a little bit, but very hard to set both uh, correctly. So right now we should release this a little bit because the outer uh, telltale is doing trouble. So it's very easy to think this way. So they should be parallel. But now the one on the outer side is doing trouble, so you have to go away from the trouble. So we could now either steer more upwind or we could release this uh, sheet to open the sail and then we would get them straight. Now, if the one on the inner side would do trouble, you go away from the trouble so you can steer away from the, the trouble, now you know, towards the port left, and then the telltales would be straight. Or if the inner one was doing trouble, which is not right now, you would have to tension this sheet until you get them parallel, which is uh, like the best uh, you want to do. Now, usually you have on the monohulls, you have this rail in this direction, so you can adjust this angle of the pull, right, of the sail. Because this is the only way that you could uh, also, you know, control the upper part of the sail more efficiently. Now, the catamarans, that's what we don't have. We do have uh, some loops, if you can look carefully. So this sail has uh, four holes, so you could adjust this angle a little bit. But you don't want to touch this because you need, uh, you know, tools and so you just, you know, do something and you keep it there. So you're probably never going to be able to set these telltales in all the wind angles you're sailing uh, parallel, like both have him. It's always a compromise here on the catamarans. Sometimes going upwind you can actually do it, but then uh, going downwind it's less and less because the sail just, you know, opens too much and you have no control over the top of the sail, you get too much twist, as we've said, because you cannot control, you see, this angle efficiently. Now releasing this one a little bit more. So let's see what happens with the sail. Okay, so now one on the top, you see it's kind of okay, but not perfect. All the way on the top of the sail, you can see that it's opened too much, too much twist, because 
uh, it's actually kind of, you know, not catching the wind properly. Uh, but this one is still uh, doing troubles, you see? So if we would really want to make this one parallel, straight, and then the one at the top would be just way too open. So that's why on the catamaran, uh, it's so hard to set these sails, uh, like, perfectly. But just do, you know, whatever feels good and uh, the speed is going to tell you if you're doing something right. We're kind of losing the winds now. And as usual, when you start sailing, you have good winds. You see, this is one hour history. And then you sail for 30 minutes and then the wind just drop. So we're still on the same course, uh, but we have changed the front sail for the big one for the big uh, light Genoa or Code Zero. Maybe I prefer to say light Genoa. So we furl the small one and we open this huge sail which has much more surface area. And actually we are kind of uh, sailing right now uh, quite efficiently. So we're doing around, you see, almost five knots and there's only eight knots of uh, true wind speed. Doing now five or five knots of ground. The true wind speed is around eight and a half. And the angle is really good. You see we have a true wind from the side, but the apparent wind is from here. So the true wind is what really is. Apparent wind is what we're feeling because we have a speed and we're actually producing wind. It's kind of paradox. So you can see here that the true wind is uh, eight knots and the apparent wind speed is, this is what we're feeling, is uh, more, one knot more, nine and a half. So we're actually producing wind and using this wind uh, to sail uh, faster. Here it is, our big sail, 100 square meters. You really want to have this. And again, you can see the telltales. And actually, this sail is made so well that you can actually kind of set them in most of the angles. It's a really good design, I just love. This sail was made by the Supreme Sails. Here's the badge. I've been uh, cooperating with them for 10 years and they're really, really like masters of uh, sail making. And we're actually moving. We are moving, you can see not much wind, but we are moving and uh, very efficiently actually. In very low winds. Looking from behind. See, this is how four to five knots looks like, and it's a pretty decent speed. So the monohull down there was the one that was, you know, very close earlier. And once the wind drops, so he doesn't have a light Genoa, code zero, so he just stopped. But we can still continue sailing uh, very well. We're making some water. So you can see here. Uh, this water going out, this is the, um, the water from the water maker. This is the salty one. This is one that's rejected back to the sea. And the fresh water goes to the tanks. So this would be a very salty one. And then in front of us, this is the second monohull, but they start uh, the engine, so they're motor sailing. And they are not much faster than we are now just with the, just with the sails. But that one uh, really stopped because he has a lack of surface area. He could also have this light Genoa Code Zero and, you know, he would be just as fast as we are, but unfortunately uh, they don't. So we are now sailing around uh, five and a half knots and this is when you start uh, feeling the little bit of sound and vibration of the propellers turning. Maybe you can hear some sounds because we are running a generator and water maker, but it's not an engine, so the engines are off. You can see this is all off. And the question is, do you want to keep uh, propellers uh, turning or you want to put gear in the reverse to stop them? So Janmar says in the manual that you should leave them, that you must leave them free rotating. Because if you don't, if you put reverse and you sail for days, you might get a little bit, a little bit of rotation, you know, on the propeller. And the whole engine would be also turning, you know, little by little. We're talking about if you're crossing an ocean. And then the water pump impeller is going to also turn a little bit. And so you're going to get water in the engine, but it's not going to be pushed out with the exhaust uh, pressure. So the water will build up in the muffler and eventually it can get into the, into the valves. And then when you start an engine, when you crank, the water doesn't compress like air and you're going to bend everything and destroy. 
Uh, but interesting, uh, I read the manual from the Volvo, and Volvo kind of says that it's okay to put in a reverse. But when you put uh, in reverse, what happens is you don't have this uh, annoying noise, uh, but you have you get slower actually because if the propeller is not turning, it's slowing you down much more than if the propeller is turning. You have less wear and tear on the gearbox, but they're kind of made, you know, to be spinning. So these noises are really annoying. So the best thing is if you own the boat, you should just have a folding propeller, which you know collapses, so it's not uh, rotating and it's uh, you gain more speed. Uh, but these charter boats, they all have you know fixed propellers because they're just cheaper. You know this one is around five, six hundred euros, and the collapsible one, folding one, can be three, four thousand. Now, when people rent a boat and they're not careful, they can get mooring lines, you know, twisted on propeller. So it's just much you know cheaper to you know have this fixed one and change them every year. Uh, but yeah, you should if you have Yanmar, you should always keep it neutral and just you know have these annoying sounds. When you're going very fast, like 10, 12 knots, uh, and then sleeping in a cabin can be very annoying. Uh, but that's how it is. Uh, if it's your boat, just buy a folding propeller and you're going to love it. You'll have more speed, less wear and tear, and silence. Let's take a look how the water maker is doing. So he's still uh, putting, you know, the very salty water out. And it's still running, so let's just see what's going on. Okay, it's looking good, so we have a good pressure. You don't want to go to the red because you can destroy the membrane. And as we've said, if the, it's not seawater, if it's, let's say you're in Norway where it's not so salty water, you don't want to have it here because you're going to destroy the membrane, you have to go less pressure. But if it's uh, like salty water, Mediterranean is very salty, you want to keep it here. And uh, this is how much we're producing. So right now we're producing 130 liters per hour, which is around 33 gallons per hour. So the thing that has been, you know, bothering me a little bit is this uh, pressure on the pre-filter. It's very low. I have cleaned the strainer. The water is going through, as we've seen, you know, it's producing water. So I'm going to change um, today probably the main filter, which might be, you know, uh, causing this trouble or there's uh, maybe, you know, just a, a problem with this gouge. But, uh, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, all the way down red. It's just telling that something might be, you know, clogged. But it's not because, you know, we obviously have the water flow. So we'll see in the next days how are we going to fix this. And then here we can see how much water we have. So we started with 10% and we're now 50%. So producing water really efficiently. And this is the control for the solar panels and generator. There is a very similar thing as we've been talking about the propeller, you know, turning a impeller water pump and then water can get in the valves. The same thing happens if you are cranking the engine and so the engine doesn't want to start and you, you know, keep cranking it. So if the engine is not working, you don't get the pressure uh, to put the water out, which you can see here usually, you know, when the engine is running, you have this plump, plump, plump. Uh, and you need this pressure, the engine has to run. Now, if you're going to be cranking an engine and it doesn't want to start and you keep cranking, cranking, you're going to build the water in here. So this is, uh, this is the muffler, you see, this, uh, this housing. And then if you put a lot of water in here and it's not, you know, the best uh, build, you can get the water back in into the valves. Now, uh, I'll show you here. So this is the, the valve that you have to close when you're cranking and then immediately open uh, to get, you know, water. So this is the raw water inlet. So definitely close this when cranking, otherwise uh, you can get uh, uh, water into the engine. So the impeller, you see this is the exhaust. So this is where the exhaust goes out and the, the, this uh, salt water that's cooling the, the engine. Now, the water is going to build in here. Now, looking at the levels, you can see that the exhaust is much higher up. So if you're going to be cranking the engine or having the propeller, you know, fixed, and it, the propeller is then going to slowly turn the engine, but that has to be for the weeks. So the water is going to fill in here, and then it's going to go in here, and then it gets directly to the, to the valves, and then it's going to go into the cylinder. And then, uh, as we've said, once you 
start an engine and the water is in the cylinder, it's not gonna compress, it's just gonna bend uh, the, the everything inside. You'll have to do a, a big maintenance. And also when you start an engine, you always wanna check if the water is coming out, which means that, you know, that this uh, valve is open and that the impeller is working and the engine is cooling. So you always check if you're getting the water out. If there's no water coming out and the engine is working, uh, definitely stop an engine and check for the problem. So the wind, you can see the history just came up. So now we have uh, 12 knots of true wind speed. And this could be a fact of this channel, you see? So the wind goes in and then just accelerates in this hard channel. And this is really good for us. So now we're sailing six and a half knots uh, and only 12 knots of true in speed, almost seven knots. That's really good. Still sailing with uh, this light Genoa full main. And this is Island Hvar, the city Hvar. A very famous uh, place, very popular. Everybody comes to show their yachts in summer. And you can see many sailboats, very popular to visit. And it just turned out to be a beautiful day. So we sailed from Island Vis. And we sail all the way here, a little bit higher up, and then we're gonna go to Arsenal. So we have uh, 70 knots of true in speed, so how to furl the sail uh, like the easiest. So first you wanna start uh, the engines. And then put the engines just in a gear because if you're not running engines on these catamarans, once you furl the Genoa, the main is going to push you too much upwind. So these catamarans are not stable just with the mainsail, like some monohulls, you can just sail it with the mainsail. But here you do need also Genoa or a little bit of uh, throttle, uh, like to have control, so that the autopilot can have control. Uh, now, uh, so there's the thing. We could uh, go upwind like most of the people do and furl the sail, but that's how you increase the apparent wind speed. So the much uh, better option is to so first prepare the furling line. So this line is going to be uh, furling the sail. And I'll have to release this one, which is the sheet, which will be you know releasing this line so that the sail can furl. Now the trick is you want to go downwind. Uh, so right now the wind is coming from here, we're upwind, so I'm gonna go downwind a lot. And as we go, I can uh, already release a little bit of sheet, uh, but keep the sail uh, full for now. So we'll go a little bit more. So the wind just increased to 20 knots, which is actually very good for this demonstration. So I'm keep opening the sail. And now you can see there's not much force anymore because I'm going downwind and we are reducing uh, the wind speed. Now, if the winds are very strong, you can put uh, a little bit more speed. Uh, and now we're gonna even lower the parent wind speed. So it's gonna be even easier to furl it. And uh, so I'm gonna have around uh, true wind angle around 150, 160 degrees. And now it's uh, very easy to furl, so not much forces, right? So you can see, I press now the furling, I release the sheet, and it's very easy to furl the sail. And you can see that it's furling uh, really nicely uh, because I'm going downwind. So although we have 20 knots of wind, it was super easy, no pressure uh, when furling the sail. Uh, a lot of people, you know, just turn the boat upwind and then start pulling this furling line. While well, you're gonna increase uh, the parent wind speed, more forces, very hard to furl it nicely. So this is the best method. And you would use the same if you get in very high winds and you just wanna reef. Just turn downwind because that's how you decrease the parent wind speed and then you can furl the sail very nicely because if you don't, you're gonna have this ugly shape when you come back. So you use this for furling it all the way or just the reefing uh, the Genoa mainsail. And the same method we also used 
for uh, Code Zero and basically all the front sails, you always want to put them down going uh, downwind. So now we're going to center uh, the main as we go upwind, of course. We still have the main sail up. Always check there's no boats around you. And as I do, I'm also going to center it in the back. Uh, just to keep the boom in the middle. Okay. Now I keep going upwind. Always check if there's no boats who are going to cross you as you're doing it. Okay, and now I'm going to put uh, wind autopilot. So we have this setting, I put wind autopilot. And I want to go straight upwind. And I do want to keep enough speed here, the more wind, the more throttle, because otherwise the autopilot is going to be you know, too lazy, too late. So putting the main sail down, this is the main uh, halyard. So there's one thing, you cannot, it's very hard to open this stopper because there's so much pressure. So the trick is to very gently, sometimes better even using the handle because you have more uh, control, but just slightly tension, you see now it's very easy to open. And now we have this second rope, which is just, you know, helping us in the last part to pull uh, the sail down. So we are now upwind, uh, the halyard is ready, I have it all the way down unfurled, make sure it's not tangled, and uh, make sure the sail has no wind in it, it's very easy, and then just, you know, we just release and pull this one as we go. Now how many donuts? Just, you know, have enough that you have a control uh, and having gloves is a really good idea. Uh, but, uh, well, I usually have them in very high winds or when racing, but uh, on the days like this, uh, you can get away. So I'm pulling also the small one so it doesn't get tangled. And releasing this one. last part this small line is going to help me bring the sail down and then I lock it gently and that's it so now the sail is down and I'll have to now I want to put the steps out because I want to put uh, you know this halyard uh, hook it here so you climb up And I'm bringing it through here uh, just because uh, otherwise you would kind of, you know, rub against this one. It just makes sense. It could be from outside, depends from the boat. Then I hook it here, make sure these guys are back in. And then I just slightly put a little bit of pressure on this halyard. Not much, you know, just enough to prevent from uh, lifting the sail. So now you can see that the wind, when the halyard is moving, it's not pulling the sail up. That's why we hook it here. It just, you know, saves wear and tear. So then you want to put the sail all the way into the back and always close the back because you don't want to destroy the sail uh, because the UV. And I have uh, this line here, which I attach here so that the boom is not, you know, going left and right. It's just, you know, more silent. Uh, no wear and tear on the main. We have anchored in this uh, beautiful bay uh, just for like you know one hour, a swim, a lunch. And uh, so when anchoring, there's a couple of things I'm interested in. Of course, it's uh, so this is the bay, and I'm interested in, like in general, you know, how deep the bay is. There's any rocks, and then uh, it's important where we drop the anchor. So this is the depth, and then uh, I have a remote control for the chain. And when engines running, which are not now, I can see how much chain I dropped. So what we've done is uh, we came to this uh, bay. And because we have these uh, winds blowing like this, 
we just uh, you know drop the anchor down there and we're just gonna stay here for a while so uh, we'll keep an eye but in case the wind shifts right then we will also shift into the rocks so this is only good now for you know just as long as you're awake not sleeping uh, just for a swim when you know the winds are gonna be from here now in Caribbean you know you have steady winds but Croatia very quickly you can get a switch to that no day winds or whatever these are now more south easterly winds uh, so we dropped uh, around uh, four times the depth of the chain so ideally in very low winds you want to put three times the depth the length of the chain so if it's five meters deep you want to put at least 15 but even better you know 20 meters uh, of the chain now if you have very strong winds you want to put uh, you know much more so let's say it's more like on 10 meters depth uh, sometimes you want to put five times like 50 60 meters of chain uh, because the more the chain the less chances the you know the anchor is going to go out so basically if this is the anchor anchor digs in and then if my hand is a chain the chain should always be on the ground so it's pulling you know the anchor is really low digged in now if the wind is too strong you know the chain is going to lift the anchor is going to be still in but then as soon as you get more wind it's going to pull the anchor out so that's why the more the wind the more the chain is in the air the longer the chain has to be so that this part which is you know like at least you know a couple of meters which is close to the anchor has to be on the ground so you can take a snorkel that's what I've done many times and just watch what the chain is doing and then once all the chain is in the air and the anchor is still digged like this is the point where you really want to put uh, more uh, chain otherwise you know it's just gonna dig it out then it's also about that kind of uh, bottom you have ideally you want to drop it into the bright spot this is where the sand is if you drop it into the grass and the grass is very thick it just might not hold well or if it's very rocky you know the anchor might hold but then might slip or might hold too much and you might have trouble you know getting it out if it holds too much but luckily in Croatia we mostly have very good uh, grounds now because we're just you know stopping for the day for one hour we're not using the Y that uh, I mean in very strong winds we would use it but right now we just you know drop the anchor and it's all good the boat is swinging a little bit more left and right because of that but because it's not so windy you know that's just you know just fine if this would be for the night then definitely you want to put uh, this Y this rope which is going to stabilize your boat and put the pressure of the winch in uh, strong winds now how do you know when anchoring that you you know that the anchor is holding so how do you anchor so first you get to the spot where you want to anchor and then you stop the boat and then you're stopped so you're not moving you drop as much as uh, chain as the depth is so if we anchor there at five meters I come there stop and I first release first five meters so that the anchor touches the bottom but only touches because if you keep going you're gonna put all the chain on the anchor it might twist it might not hold and uh, if you don't stop and you start going backwards you see by the time you're gonna drop the first five meters you're gonna be already on the different spot that you you know really wanted to drop the anchor so you come in you stop you drop the anchor to touch the ground and then you slowly reverse and you put as much as chain as we've said it depends from the strength of the wind and the depth so three to five times the depth the more the wind you know the more chain you want to put in and of course you have to think about you know turning circle because the winds change you know right now we would finish on the rocks but as you said it's just a day uh, swim now how do you know if uh, anchor is holding so you're gonna see now uh, this chain you see now the boat is going left so it's tensioning you see now there's more and more pressure and now if there's gonna be no vibration or no slip that means that the anchor is holding you see it's all good and now the boat is again being pulled upwind so basically when you're on the anchor and just having uh, see the middle point of attachment so no Y you're like a monohull and you're gonna be going left and right you know all the time and whenever you come to the extreme point you know there's gonna be the biggest pressure on the anchor you know to pull you back so what you can do is you can just observe the anchor 
You can also put, you know, your fingers here. And if you feel like da -da -dum, da -da -dum, or vibrations, you know, that's a good sign that the anchor is slipping. Uh, also visually, you know, if the chain, you know, like, you know, goes up, it's tensioning, tensioning, and then tuck, tuck, slips, slips. That means that the anchor you now holds, but then slips, holds, slips. So ideally, the chain wants to go, you know, up, no vibration, no slip, pulls the boat back up, and then, you know, goes slowly down because there's less force. Another thing you want to make sure when you're lifting the chain, so this chain goes into the chain well, which is all the way under. Some boats don't have it designed really well, so the chain would just, you know, go on one spot, go up, 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 and then eventually crash into the windlass. This is the winch, which is under here. And then it would just, you know, jam everything. And then the fuse could go out. So it's good to know where the fuse is, uh, in case this happens that very quickly you can go, you know, and put the fuse uh, back up and continue uh, sailing. Now, when you are, when you want to lift, you know, let's say we want to go and lift the anchor, you should never ever use the winch to pull the boat and the anchor against the wind, right? Because you don't want to stress this too much. They're usually not super strong and they break and they're not designed to pull the boat against the wind. So what you want to do is you want to use engines and then slowly go, you know, towards the anchor and just, you know, pick up the chain as you go. So you're not pulling the boat, you're using engines to go towards your anchor and just, you know, taking the excess chain, which is very loose. Now, in very strong winds, it can be tricky. And also because you don't see really well in which direction you have to go sometimes from the helm. So it's important that there's one person standing here uh, who's watching what's going on with the chain and then it's giving instructions you know, to the person uh, at the helm, either to go left, right, you know, more forward, slow down. And this is a very crucial, you know, communication. It's not easy, you have to work it out, whatever the signs uh, work for you. But it's really important that there's a person, you know, helping, guiding uh, the captain uh, where exactly to go. So we have talked about the fenders uh, in the previous uh, video. Uh, but now let's talk about how to, you know, coil the ropes. So there is, you know, no right or wrong way to do things or how to have fenders, you know, either they're like hanging off or they're here, you put them away. I mean, of course, if there's heavy weather, you know, you're going to put them away. If it's just day sailing in calm Croatia, you'll keep it here. And then how you're going to attach, you know, your stand-up paddle, how you're going to do this and that, you know, it's just like, there is no right or wrong. There's just like whatever works and some things just work better, you know, you can, you know, simplify your life. But it's not like, you know, something is wrong. You know, of course, it can be like really bad way to do it. So there's like one thing that uh, I've been you know, practicing recently. So the code zero, you see, you can see that we only installed uh, one sheet. You know, theoretically it should have two. But we just, you know, kind of figured out that, you know, if these two sheets are set how they're supposed to be, you know, then it's really hard, you know, to walk around it's just in a way and people want to swim, you know, so what's the point? And then when you are uh, tacking, jibing, whatever, you have to furl it in anyway. And because we're not racing, we have a lot of time. So we just figured out, hey, let's just have one. And then, you know, whenever we need it, we bring it back. And whenever we're tacking, we just, you know, take, it takes 30 seconds, one minute, take it around to the other side and then open the sail. So why not just have, you know, one? It's much, so much easier to organize the deck. Then again, somebody's gonna say it's better to have two and this is wrong, but it just, you know, works really well. They had a really good way of knowing in old, you know, Polynesian day, they were the real sailors out there, who's good and who's, uh, who's not good sailor, you know, what's wrong, what's not right. It was very easy. Whoever was a navigator and was sailing around and he was still there, you know, like on the island, he was good because he could come back, you know, whatever he was doing, it obviously worked. It could be like somebody else would do it, you know, the easier way, but whoever was alive and still, you know, was able to come back and sail, he was a good sailor. And the ones who were, you know, blown away, whatever, maybe they're just not lucky or just not experienced enough. So there's a really way, a good way of uh, coiling these ropes. 
So this is just, you know, the sheet and we put it down to the cleat uh, just, you know, to kind of, you know, stabilize the sail. And of course you want to have this, you know, tension a little bit so that the sail wouldn't, you know, unfurl. Anyway, what do you do with the rest of the rope? So you can make these very big loops and then uh, it's a really good way just, you know, to go over, under, and you get this, uh, you know, kind of shape. And this is, you know, very safe. It's not going to fall in the water. No, you know, it's kind of a good way. Now, when uh, working with these ropes, you know, there's like, very, like a lot of different uh, ways of doing it. So, so, okay, let's go from the beginning. So, what I do is, first I just make, you know, very nice loops. Like the size, it's all about, I mean, it depends how you like it, you know. If you make uh, bigger loops, you're going to coil it faster. If you do smaller loops, it's going to take longer. So, you just do, you know, whatever makes sense. Uh, so basically everybody starts like this and then the difference is then in uh, in the last part so what I do is I go around and then it's very important you know to cross here if you're not gonna cross it's just gonna slip so I cross here and I make it really really tight here and then I keep going around see like make it really tight and then I go through the hole See? And that's it. And then a tension. And this way, you see, the rope is really, you see, kind of, you know, it's compact. And now I can either, you know, wherever I put it on the floor, and if I need it, you see, I can just pull it up. It's, you know, it's never going to fall apart. You can see it's whatever I do. See, this rope is holding a good shape. And I can drop it on the floor and pick it up again. And then uh, it's very easy to store the ropes. You don't want to put them, especially if wet, into any compartments. So what I do is, but always on the back of the boat, because you don't want to have uh, ropes stored here, because if they fall in the water, they'll go into the propeller. And then I just, you know, on the back of the boat, you just, you know, hang them. So they'll dry out and they'll be on the air. And whenever you need them, it's very easy to, you know, just pick them up and use them wherever you want. A great way to see if the anchor is slipping or, you know, if you are dragging is just watching the plotter. So, so this uh, black line, this is the, our track, you know, it's really good to have it if you lost somebody while sailing. You know, you can exactly know where you were going and you can backtrack. And then also when anchoring, so you can see we came in and we dropped anchor somewhere here. Uh, and then uh, we went back and we had uh, just a little bit of chain and then we dropped more because the winds increase. So first, you know, we were just, you know, going left and right here. And then we dropped more chain and now we are doing this. So the boat is swinging left and right and this is uh, very normal, especially because we don't have the Ypsilon set up. Uh, but the most important is, is the boat going in this direction or not, you know, if it's drifting. Now, if these lines, you know, would be going more and more towards this, uh, you know, direction, then it's very obvious that your anchor is slowly slipping and something is going on. But right now you can see that, you know, we're just zigzagging on the same spot, which means that the anchor is uh, holding really well. Another method is by just, you know, picking up an object on the shore and then, you know, kind of align it with another object on the boat and then, you know, just know where you were and then you check uh, later and, you know, you can see if you are drifting forward and backwards. Uh, but this is uh, much easier here. If you have a plotter, this is a very reliable way to know. Uh, what's going on and also in the middle of the night when it's dark you cannot see the object on the shore maybe some lights but you know you can just wake up and check if your anchor is uh, holding if you're slowly you know drifting with the wind you're going to notice it uh, very quickly here and then decide if you need to re-anchor or you know maybe sometimes the anchor just you know slips but then finds a, a good hold so if you moved, you know, a little bit more, but uh, I'm repeating, so here we moved because we let out more chain because the winds uh, increased, just wanted to be sure. But let's say at night you wake up and then your boat is here. Now you, you might, you know, drifted a little bit, but now maybe the anchor has a good hold. So not necessarily always to, you know, re-anchor. So we are on Var Island. So we came from Vis today. It was a nice sailing. And now we're in this uh, Uvala Pribinja. It's a beautiful place here. 
So this is a campsite, which is still closed, uh, but just beautiful water around here. And we're gonna go to restaurant Arsenal, which is my favorite restaurant around here. Yeah. I like these solar panels more and more because there's nothing sticking out. I've seen some similar panels, but then they have these uh, models kind of, you know, sticking out and just like a question of time when you're gonna put it off. But these are just smooth. They're kind of, uh, you see, like rough. You can step on them and they do provide a really good uh, power. We tied to a buoy here and this is again a different system. So again, there would be a huge uh, concrete block uh, down there and then the rope. And then you can see there's a loop and a small line going to the floaty. So definitely don't, you know, use the small line or don't put your rope through the floaty because this is just supposed to keep the big line up. And then you have to put your big lines through the big thick loop. And this is how you do it. And then sometimes these small buoys are, you know, banging in the hull. So during the night, sometimes you might just want to, you know, pull them up if you're on a mono hull. But looks like we'll be good here because it's catamaran. It's much uh, further apart. Now there's very little wind. So you can see that this angle of the ropes, you see, it's kind of here. Like the more wind you get, the more forward, of course, it would go because you would need more strength, you know, to pull the boat uh, against the wind. Uh, now the thing is, if we had really, really low winds, then of course these lines would be, you know, just like here, which is, you know, just fine. Now the question is, if you're using the original cleats, which are around one and a half meter more backwards, you see, then if you have uh, no wind, these ropes would fall under the boat and you would get, you see, the loop somewhere here. And then when you get winds back again, you know, these ropes, which go now from the cleat around the boat, they would just rub the hull, you see? So it doesn't make sense. So I'm really surprised why, you know, nobody's offering these front cleats as a standard or as an option. But so far, you know, a really good solution. Now you do have to be careful. You see this uh, Dinema line that's holding the pin on. You don't want to put uh, this rope from the inside because then uh, going forward, you know, it would probably, you know, just break all this uh, furling system and our light Genoa, which wouldn't be good. So you do want to keep it here. Now, sometimes in some bays, you have very, you know, like twisting winds and the boat goes forward, backwards. And this, um, you know, can be a trouble if there's a lot of, uh, wind and huge gusts because then the boat you know could go forward these lines go backwards the buoy you know goes under and you would get quite a lot of force on these uh, these lines and from this angle you see if you push just physics if you push like this you get a high force uh, you know pulling the rope together it's like the worst you want to do so you do have to keep an eye on this and just seems like that if we would be using the original cleats and uh, supposing that the rope would fall under the hull and the buoy would get here, uh, so you wouldn't, uh, those small lines wouldn't be such a big problem. It would be just uh, scratching the anti-fouling. Uh, but then again, even if the rope uh, goes there, there's no guarantee that it's gonna, you know, actually fall down. It can still stay around above and, you know, hit this line uh, just the same, just a little bit less chances. Well, sometimes I'm just using uh, this one. If it's very light winds, I just use a rope from here over this one. Uh, and then uh, going in, that's for the very light winds, it's uh, just fine. But then sometimes the anchor is in the way. So it's just like kind of, you see, it's kind of struggle to tie these uh, catamarans in all the different conditions. If you have, you know, perfect conditions, you know, like 10 knots of wind, like you have mostly in BVI, it's very easy, you know. But in Croatia, when you have these calm nights and currents and the boat goes over the buoy and then I get a gust from here and turns the boat like this and a gust from here turns, you know, just keeps turning the boat all night, then, you know, sometimes it's a big challenge to tie the boat uh, that you don't damage anything and that there is no squeaking and no uh, noisy sounds during the night. Now, because of all these issues, then you would see, you know, people just using, why not just use uh, one cleat? 
So let's just uh, take, uh, you know, the loop and just uh, put the loop around the cleat. See, why not? It's actually, you know, in the low winds, it actually kind of works just fine. But in uh, strong winds, you see the boat is then going to be, you know, a little bit at the angle. And you're just going to produce uh, much bigger forces uh, on the whole, you know, buoy system, which, you know, sometimes can break. And also the boat, you know, would be doing this like a monohull, which produces uh, higher strength again so there is like no universal um, answer to how tie a catamaran to the buoy it's just kind of challenging we just got some uh, gust and you can see that you see the loop is now going behind and now we can say have we have a little bit of pressure now on this uh, dynema lines from the uh, code zero system same there, so you can see it's, you know, touching a little bit. If it's just gentle, you know, it's okay. But if you get a, a huge gust, or if you're really lucky, unlucky how the boat turned, when there was a big change of the, you know, wind direction, you just might produce a lot of uh, forces there, which you don't want. But anyway, the boat is going to turn now, and then the rope is going to come forward. It's just, you know, this, the moment when the boat, the wind is shifting, and then uh, the boat has to turn so now we're going to point in this direction and everything is going to be fine it's just a problem when you have really high winds high gusts and when these uh, ropes touch you know the dynamo lines excessively we have a little bit of south winds and they bring a little bit of clouds and then just uh, the picture on the camera doesn't look so nice anymore you need sun you know to go through the water to get these beautiful colors of Croatia. I have checked the strainer, uh, which is clean, I cleaned it. So the last thing uh, that could be causing these pressure problems is uh, the filter, pre-filter. That's a 5 micron, you know, just pre-filter, it might be already, you know, clogged and fouled. So I'm gonna use this, uh, put up here, and then unscrew it down, and we're gonna put a new one in. Hopefully this is gonna solve this problem. It was very easy to remove this filter. So this is the filter and it looks it looks pretty green. Actually it is, you see this is all algae. So this is ready for the replacement, so that's why I was causing uh, pressure problems. And the more dirty the water is, uh, the more fault they're gonna be. So I'm taking now the, the fresh one. Rinse this okay. These are just standard uh, 5 micron uh, filter, nothing special, you know, you don't need the original. It's a standard dimension, so it's pretty easy. And then you put it in. And then you should fill it up with water, like with any water. It can be fresh water, because... Uh, We'll just run it a little bit longer so it goes out. Otherwise it runs dry and uh, it's not so good. Okay. Okay. You always want to check for the seal. Make sure the seal is still on. Okay, a little bit clumsy, but okay, I'll be better next time. Okay, installation complete, and now we're gonna check if this is uh, this is gonna solve the problem. Okay, so generator is running, and let's see if this is gonna solve the problem. This is working really well. You can see now on the pre-filter. Uh, the pressure is really good uh, so yeah it was just a really really fouled filter so this is a very good indicator of the condition of the of the filter when it's on the red it's a good sign that it needs changing 
And actually, you know, it took one month. It was brand new one month ago. So it looks like we'll have to change this uh, like regularly. I'll slowly put up the pressure. Now I'm gonna go very slowly because uh, I put in uh, fresh water in the pre-filter so I just want to make sure that uh, that water is flushed out before I put uh, uh, like all the all the, all up to the pressure right because if you have uh, just semi salt water you don't want to have uh, you know a lot of pressure and the good indicator is uh, so the flow you're getting so if it's rated to maximum height 40 you don't want to you know go more Bring it out very slowly. Yeah, very good. So I can see now that at much smaller pressure we are producing uh, more water. And this is uh, really good. We have a good pressure now. And yeah, this is really good. And I'm still waiting, still a red lamp here. Because it just takes a little bit of time until the water quality is good. Water quality is just about salinity and very quickly it's gonna turn uh, green. Okay, now it's green so I can now divert to tank and now we are filling up the water. And then always after uh, changing any filters you wanna run a water maker and just check uh, for all the leaks. And if it's all good, you're good to go. Another uh, place where the problem could be is the strainer, which is here in the back cabin. So this is the back cabin, and then the water maker would be just right there behind that wall. And you really want to have these two together, and you don't want to have a water maker very high above the water level because then he's struggling to pull uh, the water high. So I've seen the boats where they mount it uh, like too high and then uh, the machine is just struggling, you get a lot of vibrations on the, on the hoses. So this is the way to do it. So this is the strainer, it's just basically just a very fine mesh and the valve. So this is the intake of the salt water. And then you can just close this and use this tool to open the top, it's very easy, and then you put out this mesh. If you have a very, you know, a lot of algae and whatever, uh, you could like clog this filter. Uh, but we had the pre-filter, which is after this one, clogged, and um, yeah, you just have to check uh, both of these. And here, uh, this is the switch. If you wanna put, uh, you know, that uh, chemical inside uh, to store the machine for the winter, and then you just put the bucket. Uh, this into the bucket and you put that uh, whatever chemical it is and then run it through the machine so it doesn't get uh, damaged if you're not using it because water maker has to be used all the time if it's not uh, used regularly then you have to uh, they say pickle it or basically just putting in some chemicals to prevent uh, fouling the membrane mostly the, the membrane for uh, where the high pressure is, you know, where the water is actually produced. Everything looks good here. We have a good pressure on the pre-filter. So, yeah, I'm gonna slowly put the pressure off. You wanna do this very slowly. They actually say you should do it like for in a minute. But I guess uh, just, you know, doing it like this is gonna be just fine. Okay, and then I'm gonna divert it uh, off the tanks. So next time we start, we don't fill the tanks with uh, you know, too salty water, and now we're gonna put it off. Actually put it on auto flush, which means if we don't use it for seven days automatically, it's gonna use the water from our water tanks to flush. And then uh, you can, you know, like 
not use the machine for one week. But if it's going to be more than one week, then you really want to, you know, pickle it, put that chemical uh, inside. And then again, when you're flushing these membranes with, uh, with the water from the tanks, if you have, uh, you know, water from the marina, which has chlorine, it can damage the membrane, which is, you know, expensive part. So you really want to have, uh, this boat has kind of a carbon filter, which is going to eliminate uh, the, the chlorine. So it, you know, protects the membrane. Or if you don't have this, uh, you can just flush it with the water reproduced with the water maker, because that water is, you know, pure H2O, it's like a desolated water. Or you could use, you know, a desolated water, uh, which is, you know, also pure H2O. Konoba Arsenal, this is like, this is the place you want to come. The really good food. We're starting with this uh, mussels on Buzara and you can dip bread in. This is like really, really good. You don't want to miss this. We had a very calm night today. So there was a strange sound and I couldn't, you know, first figure out what it was. And because there was like, you know, no wind, nothing, these ropes were just, you know, straight down. And they were actually rubbing against the Dinema line of the Pinon. And you could hear it, you know, inside the boat, something like straight, you know. And you don't want to have this, you know, just, you know, when there were small waves, it was just, you know, kind of a little bit of friction and strange noise. So I decided to put uh, one of these ropes, the one from the other side, which is now missing, and I put it directly over the pulley. So it goes here. Move this. So I use this pulley uh, to put it uh, here on this cleat. It just seems like it was, uh, you know, causing wear and tear. Now you can use this in the light winds, and if you look carefully. I also went inside, you see, as we've said before, when you're lose, uh, using uh, those lines, you have to go out from the Dinema lines, but when using this one, you're going to want to go from inside. Now, this is good for low winds, because in the high winds, you just kind of get uh, a lot of pressure on this small thing, and also a lot of side movements and a lot of squeaking. Um, it's also good to use it if you're going to take a line ashore, then it kind of works. But when you have a, you know, high winds and the boat is moving left and right, this one is usually not the best. And I just noticed, you know, some kind of, see, some kind of wear here. So this could be, I've seen it before already, so this could be from this uh, Dinema line. So we'll have to keep an eye on this. Yeah, definitely have to keep an eye on this. These hatches are, they're just fine. Uh, except uh, these hinges, when you get them new, they do crazy sound like you know, So now I fix this. What I did actually, I unscrewed this nut, opened a little bit and I put in the, the best quality olive oil, extra virgin oil from Croatia. And see, there's no more sounds, it's really good. But now just a little bit of soft, but then you can use this, uh, is this Allen key? I know the English word. So you, just by tensioning a little bit more, you get more friction, so a little bit more. And then, you know, when you're sleeping inside, a little bit more. Let's see now. Yeah, this is a little bit better. It's actually kind of getting really hard, hard to adjust this. Uh, It's better now. Anyway, these hatches, uh, they're like, they're not the most, you know, high-tech ones. They're now just built, you see, from the frames and uh, there's a small plastic in between. You can see these two screws. So this is one half of aluminum and another one. And they put this window in between. Now what happens all the time is that this plastic here, which is connecting and the screws are holding it, it breaks. It happens all the time on all these boats and then you just have to put a new plastic in. Another thing is uh, this seems to be leaking. Oh, there is kind of a cover actually, see it's missing already because this cover, it's like it doesn't work really well and then it doesn't, it's open and then it, you just lose it. Uh, so then you always get a leak here and this is also not good. 
This is my cabin, so it's all the way in the front of the boat. It's more like a cave, so you dive in, just like this, so this is the height. It's like cool, you wake up in the middle of the night, you can check if everything is fine and then just go in. It's kind of actually easier uh, than being in a cabin and walking out. And actually, uh, well, it is the worst cabin on the boat, except in very hot summer days, you kind of get a lot of air uh, here more than in a cabin this side. Uh, but then again, uh, they have good air conditioning in there, which is uh, not here. Actually, this boat has a little bit of air conditioning. This is like uh, just like custom built, but usually you don't get any air conditioning uh, in here. I have a small uh, ventilator. Let's go in. Uh, it's a very small cabin, just enough to stretch. There's a small light, and this window. This is a lifesaver, so you get you know some kind of you know. Uh, airflow. Uh, some people order this, uh, some boats don't have this because you have to pay extra, but then uh, you don't get enough air just through here. But now you know you have very nice uh, airflow uh, through here, so it works really well. Then, in hot summer days, oops, I use this uh, ventilator and I connect it to external battery, and it can actually work for three days. And it's like you know, this gets free options and it's just enough you know to make a cabin cool and then I usually put it here so up here and then uh, you have a nice you see breeze and good ventilation it actually does miracles it's just big enough you see that uh, I can stretch And then I still have kind of, uh, you know, a lot of space here. Enough space for some bag and stuff. Now this cabin is one of the biggest. Lagoon 42 has also a decent cabin. But then uh, Lagoon 50, it's half this size, even though it's a bigger boat. And the Lagoon 450, you cannot stretch. So when you're sleeping, at least me, I have to have my legs like this. And it's really miserable. Uh, so this Lagoon 46, uh, this uh, cabin, is actually, well, the biggest one I've seen on the lagoons. Uh, actually works, you know, it's all good, except when it's raining, it's kind of miserable, but as long as you have a good weather, it's okay. One downside is that, you know, in the morning, we get bright, you know, now already at 5, 5.30, you know, it's too early, you want to sleep until 7, but it's kind of hard to sleep because, you know, you get so much light. So when lifting the anchor and of course dropping it, we've said we have this remote here, uh, which is up and down also, it's a chain meter, so it tells you how much you dropped. Now the thing is when you're doing it, uh, you don't see really well what's going in here, so it, you would want, you know, like another person uh, helping you. Now forward, you know, we have uh, another uh, remote control, so you can open uh, this one. Twist these guys open, so this is working pretty well. And then in here we have uh, this remote, so this is you know up and down, so you can operate also from here. Uh, very useful sometimes for fine adjustments because you can see you know anchor from here, uh, like the second person you know could be here. Now the problem is when you are alone because you're up there and you don't see really well, so it's kind of you know you have to run up and down. So let's close this one. This is the water tank, just like kind of storage. Here's this uh, remote, I took it out. And the biggest issue is the chain well. So uh, sometimes you have these problems with the chain. So when it's going, let's say you dropped all the chain, uh, it's gonna go, you know, like on the same spot and hit into the winch and get jammed. So to open this one, it's kind of a little bit, you know, it's kind of tricky to have to find these buttons on this side. And then it's very hard to grab it. Okay. But then again, you see, it doesn't uh, kind of fit because you have this, uh, see, it's hitting here. It doesn't want to open too much. So it's kind of a uh, really bad design and you don't want to get uh, your head, you know, crashed. So what we do is uh, we use this as a support and then we put it here. It's kind of annoying to do it all the time. But it's the only way. Oh, 
Okay, uh, so the train well is in here. So it goes here, and now this is the chain. So uh, you can see how high uh, the chain came. So if we would continue, it would eventually, you know, uh, crash into the winch. So that's why ideally one person is here using the remote, you know, to put the, ch the anchor up and also, you know, watching here. Now, if the, you know, if the chain gets, you know, too much high, so it's going to crash into the, into the winch, then you have to, you know, crash it with a stick or something so it falls down. But the thing is that, you know, it's just kind of annoying. So this thing is not, you know, working as it should be. So you put your head in, it crashes. Uh, it's just kind of, you know, why is it not made uh, easier? Like that you could open here something, you see, like this part, and then just, you know, use this to, you know, kick the chain uh, so it falls down, doesn't go into the winch. We're sailing uh, towards Brach, and this is the Splitska uh, passage. And this is where today it's Friday, so all the fleet, charter fleet, is gonna go through here today. And we just noticed down there, there is a boat. It's quite far, not sure how well you can see it. Anyway, this is a fishing boat, and it's pulling the fish. So he's walking the fish because it's a fish farm very close. And if you look carefully, like, you know, if you're not very, like, you just don't figure it out that this is connected because the fish farm is so low. And then there's a long line. So this is a fishing boat and this is a fish farm and they're like walking the fish and they're doing it now on the Friday where all the boats are going to pass. And if you're not cautious, you know, there's a line which you don't see and from far away, I mean, when you get closer, you can see, but very quickly, you know, it's so funny they're doing it right here and it's not marked uh, as you would expect. It's kind of funny. You could easily miss this. We're coming to the ACI Marina split. Seems like this boat in front of us, this monohull, is going to go in reverse, uh, which is, uh, you know, this small marina is sometimes a very good uh, tactics because you already have uh, control over the boat and uh, it's easier than, you know, turning inside a very small marina, especially if there's strong winds. Reversing with a monohull is really smart. But then again, uh, with the uh, catamarans, I'm just going to go in and then uh, turn because it's very easy to turn, uh, you know, just putting one engine forward and backwards. And it's harder to reverse because basically you don't see anything uh, that's behind you. That's the problem. Baboku, abo velo, može? Abo vela, da? Čeka, da? Trebali bi biti, da? Ili ga zovi, molim te. Jureta. Ja sam mu rekao. I'm going to set now uh, a reverse cameras. These cameras are not the best, but it's, you know, what we get. So I have to watch for all these uh, mooring lines. In the terrain, yeah, and there's loads of them. And catamarans, they have these propellers, you know, on the sides. So very quickly you hook uh, these mooring lines. And then especially in strong winds. These marinas were built uh, years ago, but then the boats got bigger. So you can see these mooring lines, they shouldn't be going such, you know, so down on the, this angle. Uh, they should go much more forward, but there's no space, so it's just how it is. We're used to this. Uh, in the strong winds, uh, you don't want to mess it up. You need to go with speed and uh, do everything properly. So yeah, reversing. Basically, I don't see anything behind. So it's all just feeling. Another thing is I don't see what people are doing. So we went through uh, with my crew how to do it. It's not you know easy to tie a boat. And then if you don't see what's going on, it's another challenge. So um, yeah, it can be quite tricky. Now I have this camera for behind, you know, just for have the distance. So you can see at each side it's very narrow. So there should be guys waiting for me, but they're not waiting. So at this point I'm going to lock the wheel and I'm just going to use the engines. So 
So I go engine backwards. It starts rotating me now and also stopping the boat. And then I'll go a little bit forward. So one engine is forward, one backwards. So basically I'm now uh, just twisting the boat. If you much, go too much forward, you go backwards. Oh, the guy, okay, the guys are coming from the charter company. Okay, and now we're gonna start slow reversing. Okay, is it Pazadi Snimova? Masha, Zadi, yeah. So now I'm reversing slowly backwards. I don't see much, but I'm just relying on my intuition i can see a little bit on the camera but then again not easy so now i'm gonna check the distance here now around two meters very hard to judge on the cameras so it's very helpful if somebody's helping you from behind Now we have the back line set. Now we're going with this mooring line. Now the key is you don't want to get it into the propeller. So he's walking it, he's doing it correctly. But very quickly you can get this line into the propeller, which wouldn't be so fun. Yeah, so we're now tying one rope. This is one of the best hoses, you see. Now it's very short, and I'm gonna connect it, and then I'm gonna close uh, this one, and then open the water, and just look at what the magic does. It looks like a moving snake, but now it's filling up with water. And we're gonna get a super long hose now. See this? Like from a tiny, tiny hose, you get a super big one. And I just love this system because it's uh, so easy to fold it and use it. It's just a genius thing. So these uh, Mediterranean mooring lines, so it's a very small line. You see, that's then, uh, and they, you know, give you this line and then you take it and then you walk it forward. And then the small line is connected to the big one. So you can see on the other boat, it's connected to the big one. And then you pull the big one out. And then further out, sometimes it's just a chain, you know, along the bay or just a big uh, concrete block. And that's, uh, you know, where this line is uh, attached. And then you put it on your own cleat. So you have to be careful here because many times these are tangled and uh, you know don't break your back this is like not very ergonomically you know positioned so you know be careful you know so what we actually did is uh, we didn't you know tighten it all the way uh, because we used engines for that so the method is uh, you want to be you know a couple more meters than eventually you want to be see let's say now we're a meter and a half so we went three meters and a half away and then we tangent the mooring lines by hand, but not all the way, because you know you don't want to break your back, you know, just like as much as you can easily. And then we used uh, the engines, you know, put them reverse, but you have to be super careful, make sure that you know there's no these mooring lines under the propellers or anywhere. And then we tangent these mooring lines, and then we tangent these ropes on the back to get just the right distance. Now these mooring lines, sometimes they go directly to the block, sometimes there's a chain. 
and then there's a block. And here you have a chain, so it's super heavy, so it's very hard, you know, to pull it by hand. But if you don't tension it, you know, then in very strong winds, eventually everything's going to move uh, backwards. So it's kind of, you know, uh, you learn with time. Now, another thing is the angle. You see, they are not always, you know, perfectly angled. Like you can see on that boat, it goes like you know, left and right. Uh, it should, you know, theoretically go like this. But now this one is going there. See, so that's not perfect, but it's, you know, just how it is. It's going to work, but you have to be careful. Now, let's see, this one here. So this one here is a little bit better angle, so it goes like this. Although I would prefer it, you know, to be a little bit more forward. Now, what we've said, you can see here, they go really down, you know, it's like too short and puts too much stress on the cleats in case of strong winds. So these uh, lines, you know, they should go like forward at a certain angle, not directly down. But as it's a very small marina, the boats are getting bigger. Uh, that is how it is. So what we did is, uh, coming in, we choose uh, this line first, because this line is what's, you know, the wind is coming from here. So you want to use uh, this line first. So that's the first line you want to fix. And then you can control the boat, you know, just with the throttles and keep it steady. And then we did another line on the other side. And once this is fixed, you can theoretically just, you know, go forward with the engine. And then these lines are gonna, you know, keep you, uh, you know, in a place. Because you cannot go forward, but they're keeping you, you know, like straight. Even if there's a strong wind from the side, you see, just using the back lines and engine forward is gonna stabilize the boat. But be careful, there should be nothing close to propeller. And then uh, once you've done that, then you have a lot of time to grab a mooring line, you know, and then very carefully, slowly pull it up and then uh, put it here on the cleat, tension as much as you can, then go backwards with the engines and then uh, finally tension the back ropes again. So yeah, you know, docking in these small marinas, it's very tricky. We were lucky today because there was uh, not much wind. Uh, when there's more wind, uh, it's very useful to have a crew that can do, you know, tie a line to the cleat very uh, quickly. And here you can see how narrow this is. I'm not sure how it looks on the camera, but like, you know, going in here, uh, it is pretty tricky. Then to get off the boat, uh, we have this uh, very nice plank. Like you can see most of the boats, they have these wooden ones, and which are like too small, crappy. And it always happens that in the waves, you know, when it's more windy, they fall off, you know. So the best is to have the hydraulics, but that's what charter boats don't have usually. It's too expensive, you know, to break it. Now, these ones are pretty good because you see here, they have wheels. And here they go in this uh, hole. So it's, uh, you know, a pretty, pretty good one. You see, it goes in here. And then we have one here. And then on the other side, we have uh, two more holes so that uh, you can adjust the distance. So there's one here and one there. So just depending from uh, on which side you want to put the plank and how far uh, the pier is. And we have connected the electricity. So this is the electricity and then the cable goes over here. And then it goes to the electric, how do you call this? Anyway, you plug it in here. Now the point is, you should always plug your boat first and then here, because if you plug this first and then you drop that part in the water is trying to connect your boat, it's not going to finish well. So connect the boat first and then connect here. And always, see, this one's ours. Oh, this is kind of broken. I'll just put it in the, in the other one. And I'll explain. And I'll explain why this happens. Because people walk and they hook, see, and they pull out uh, everything. It's just a typical problem. So this is ours, you see, I put it around. So in case somebody's gonna hook there, there's much less chances, you know, to be this pulled out because, you know, it goes around. Now this one goes just directly, which is not so good. So, you know, wrap it a couple times around. And I would do, you know, even more, uh, but it's just the, now our cable is quite short, so I just managed to do it uh, once. Now we have uh, two more ropes here, we call it spring lines. So this rope, so theoretically, this rope 
on this side and on the other one, they prevent from both from going forward. And then from going left and right, use the spring lines, which are at much uh, bigger angle. And this is going to prevent both from going left and right, uh, because we don't want to lose the plank. Now this one, you see, it's very good angle. This one, you know, it's not perfect, but I know it's going to be very calm tonight, so I didn't complicate much. But this angle should be bigger, and this line should be longer. You never want to uh, want to have very short lines, in case there's big waves. You know, it's not going to stretch much, so you can you know break your cleat. So ideally, this one should be here on this cleat, and then you see I would get much better angle. You know, keeping the boat steady left and right, and much longer rope means more stretch in case of, you know, big waves or movements, so you're not breaking your cleat. But really, it's going to be very calm tonight, so, so I did a small compromise here. Now, these fenders are very important here. If you're going to crash, you know, into the pier, you're going to crash with that corner. And you can see that many boats have these corners crash, so you do want to have fender here. Now, I do kind of prefer to have the, you know, these big fat ones here. But for some reason, we're just using these ones now. Uh, but you know, if it's bigger and fatter, you know, it just gives you more distance. But you know, it should work. It should be, you know, just the same. We use this small line to attach the plank, just in case everything falls in the water. You really don't want to lose this. And then the lines, see? You should like put them in a corner or just hang them. You don't want anybody to fall in. So now, you know, reversing uh, in, it's uh, very tricky because you don't see much. You see, from here, when you look backwards, like, you have no clue how close to the pier you are, and you have no clue, you know, what people are doing. It's very dangerous, somebody might fall in the water, you know, is trying to, to, you know, pass the line, and you don't see unless you're here, see, which is very far from the throttles. So ideally, the throttles should be here on one side, which they were on the, some previous models, so I could sit here, operate the boat, see, and I would have a very good uh, vision. But for some reason, Lagoon chooses uh, to make it harder, so they put it there, so it's a very bad position. So, you have these cameras, which have said uh, it's very hard to use them, uh, very hard to judge uh, distance, and like, you know, it's, it's okay, but it's, I don't find it, you know, very useful. Uh, so, yeah, you need to get used to this. If you compare this one to the Lagoon 42, this one is much harder to dock. Because, you know, you would actually need a professional crew, one member. Uh, but, um, yeah. Judge for yourself. And write in the comments. With this uh, pin on, we still have uh, these problems, you know, when people go out and they don't know how to they, you know, charter a boat. They're not used to it, and then you know, they keep crashing in here, which is not good. So I still don't have a good solution. Like, we could remove the sail each time and whatever, but uh, I don't know. So we're going to set the code zero, but I'm just going to call it a light Genoa, because uh, it's basically a light Genoa. So we're just using a single line, as we've discussed, uh, because it's just, you know, easier. And I always remove it. If you keep it installed, then, uh, you know, it's just in a way, so you can just, you know, put it here on this cleat. And you see, it's so easy and so quickly to set it. And then uh, you just run it. Uh, see, very quickly around here. You do have to go around this one if you go from inside it's not going to work it has to go from outside and then we have this special uh, pulley and then you have to go under uh, just like a common sense so, so in no time uh, this is set and then we put it here on the winch Couple turns. Now, as we've said, so one person has to pull this by hand, but you do have to release forward 
and help it initially, otherwise uh, you don't want to pull with this, you just want to take the rope, take the slack, but open on the front of the sail. So can you just pull this one? As I go, so just, you know, taking out the slack. So then I'm using this uh, blue line, which is furling the slide Genoa. And then, uh, you see, I want to help with opening. Because if uh, they're just pulling the sheet, it doesn't work that well. So initially you want to, this one is kind of, okay. And then once the wind catches, if it's low wind, you can either release. If it's stronger wind, then you can kind of, you know, break with this blue line so that it doesn't go, you know, like bang. It's just the same as the Genoa, very similar. Okay, so the sail is open. Now we just need to get the right tension. So the right tension is the one that, you know, makes the sail inflate. Yeah, that's probably good. No, yeah, it's good, yeah. We don't want to overdo it. Okay, now let's stop the engines. When you have engines helping you, then you have uh, less apparent wind, but now we want to have this apparent wind for sailing. We have a 9.4 knots of throwing speed, and you can see apparent wind speed is less. That's because we're going with the wind and we're actually losing wind. If we would be going upwind, then we would produce the wind, so apparent wind speed would be higher than true wind speed. Now, the lagoon will say you shouldn't do this because there's no mainsail. Uh, I guess at light speed it's okay, but we've done also at higher speeds. Uh, but anyway, there's just this, we've talked in the previous videos, misunderstanding. It's not clear exactly what you could, you can't. But from my experience, you can push it pretty much just with a forward sail. So this is now the angle. Uh, we're just gonna set autopilot now on the wind. So the autopilot keeps the wind. It's gonna be now apparent wind angle. So we're gonna set it to 130 apparent wind angle. Because in Croatia the winds do change a lot because of you know of the it's a channel and then you have different islands. So having now uh, 11.7 true in speed, 9.5 apparent, and we're doing 4.2 knots. Now we're going you know kind of downwind. So downwind these speeds are not big. We could be doing uh, much more now if you had uh, the winds from the side. But well, we're not going here. We have to go here. So that's how we sail today. And I just love this sail, as I keep saying, like this is a masterpiece. It just works in uh, like most of the angles. I'm gonna call it light Genoa, not code zero. It's a great material. It's, uh, you know, like, it looks really good. It's very durable and it's not too soft. If it's too soft, then it you know, breaks too quickly. And when it's furled and if there's too much wind, you have to remove it. So it's kind of, you know, it's firm, but it's kind of soft and it's, you can kind of bend it a lot. It's a really, really good uh, stuff. And the cut is just perfect. We didn't want to have a too deep cut. You know, sometimes they make it too deep and then you're not able to go kind of upwind. It's mostly just downwind. It doesn't make sense. So this is kind of universal shape. You can see now even for downwind, see, it's just perfect and it also works all the way up to 50 or even less apparent wind angle uh, which is uh, really good so it's 100 square meters it's just beautiful you see without this sail right now going downwind we could open you know just the the genoa the jeep which is you know more than half smaller uh, so we wouldn't really be sailing right now we would be just floating we had to use uh, the engine now, why don't we open the mainsail? We could open the mainsail, but because we're going uh, downwind, then the Genoa would be in the shade. Okay, then, okay, we can zigzag, but then zigzagging, you need much bigger angle, takes a long time. 
So it's just the best, you know, option. That's at least what I think is having a huge this light Genoa, 100 square meters, and now we're sailing really downwind, very efficiently. Really happy with this sail, and it's you know it's really fun. It's easy to open, easy to operate, very easy to furl. Even if strong winds, as you showed, you know, you always put the geno out, put it in the shade, easy to furl it. So, you know, because with these mainsails, it's kind of, you know, a lot of people don't open it because it takes time and effort. So when you have like a nice day, you just want to go downwind, open this and just sail down. We had a little bit of rain during the night and you can see this is the Sahara sand. So we'll just wash the boat once we get to Marina. So you can see everywhere, it's just the dust. So it comes from Africa. And when you have south winds and it just, yeah, it's the Sahara sand. It goes very high in the atmosphere and then just, uh, you know, it comes here to Croatia. And we hate it. You see, everything is kind of sticky. The wind has stopped, so we have furled a light Genoa. Now the thing is, you want to furl it very nicely, like not, you know, too loose. If you go too loose and if the material is very light, uh, then on the top, you see, it can get like, you know, in the 30 knots of wind, you're going to break it. It would get very loose and start flapping. Uh, so, but this material we have is really good because we actually had it up uh, in 30 knots of wind. And the sail had no issues, you know, just being up, you know. It's just the right weight. It's not too heavy. It's not too light. I just find it the perfect combination. So, and I'm sure... It would be also good if you're on the anchorage, you know, up to 40 knots. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, you have to keep an eye, but you do have to furl it uh, very nicely. Like definitely in any storm and big winds, it's recommended, you know, to put it down. Uh, but if it's just, you know, short 30 knot uh, gust and you're awake, you know, you can uh, keep an eye, you know, watch. But definitely you have to furl it uh, quite firm, uh, not too loose, and then make sure that the line, the blue one here, you know, is uh, locked and that the, you see the sheet, the other line going down to the cleat is, you know, also uh, tangent so that the sail couldn't just uh, open for no reason. We are sailing upwind and now let's talk uh, how efficiently sail upwind. And there is this parameter which is called VMG, which is uh, velocity made good. So we have full sails. And we have tensioned them uh, a lot, so, you know, mostly set for upwind sailing. Uh, we have a decent speed, a decent wind, and now let's check what the VMG is. So we're sailing upwind, which means we want to get here. And now uh, this is, you know, we cannot go directly upwind, of course, we have to zigzag. Now the angle we're using is apparent wind angle, so we've talked about uh, true wind and apparent wind. So the true wind is where the wind really is blowing from. The apparent is what you feel. Like, you know, when you're on the bicycle and you're not moving, there's some wind. You start moving on your bicycle and you get wind from the front. So that's apparent. That's what you feel. So the boat always sails on the apparent wind angle. And we have a wind autopilot, which is keeping the 35 apparent wind angle. Uh, if you look at the true wind, you can see that the true wind is always, I mean, not always, upwind sailing is always going to be bigger. It's now around 49, 50 degrees, the true wind angle, but the apparent wind angle is uh, 35, so 15 degrees difference. Anyway, we have to go zigzag, you know, to come up here. Now, is it better to go like sharper and slower? Because the more upwind you sail, the slower the boat goes, it's just physics. Or you want to go faster and not so sharp, and you're going to be doing a longer way. So if you go sharper, you're going to do, you know, less, shorter way, but slower. Or going a little bit, you know, bigger angle, you're going to go faster, but your way is longer. So this is where the VMG uh, comes into account. Now, uh, we have this parameter, and this is telling you the speed up with. So this is our speed over ground, but VMG is what we're making good. So directly towards the wind. Now, so how do we use this? Uh, let's just say, let's set the boat, so four degrees, five degrees left. So now we're going to set 40, wind, 40 degrees of apparent wind angle. Now let's see what happens. So the speed over ground will go up because by increasing the 
angle, these boats go faster. So you can see it's already 5, 5.1. Well, the VMG is kind of dropping. Isn't this funny? Like, we're going faster, but we're going slower here, which means we're going faster this direction, but we're not going faster where we really want to go. So let's do another, another 5 degrees. So now we're on 45, apparently, in the angle. And let's see, see, speed over ground is increasing. Now the VMG dropped a little. Okay, dropped more, 2.9. So see, we're much faster, but our VMG speed where we want to go is much lower. So now let's set it 10 degrees. So back to 45 apparent wind angle. Let's see what happens. So the speed is going to drop and VMG is going to go up. Okay, so the velocity made good. See, it's already on three knots. Now the ferry just passed us. So we're going to get hit by those waves. So it's going to affect uh, our uh, speed. But anyway, you can see that, you see VMG is climbing a lot. It was under three, now it's 3.7. And the speed over ground dropped. So what we've just learned is that basically there is a sweet spot which is going to give you the maximum VNG. What is it? Well, it depends from the boat, from the sea conditions, but it's uh, about understanding what the VMG is. So uh, many times people think, you know, oh, we're going faster, we're going to get upwind sooner. Well, not necessarily, it depends from the boat. Now, my tactics uh, on this uh, Lagoon Catamaran was always go slow and go sharp upwind. And that's how we won uh, many regattas with the Lagoon Catamarans where most of the people were going for the speed while we were going for the better angle and in the end we won. Uh, the same thing is with the VMG is you can go downwind and then it's going to say minus. So let's say we want to go downwind which would be, you see, this direction. Now, you can go straight downwind which is the least efficient, let's say. You can also zigzag downwind, see, and then theoretically you could have more speed. Now, the more performance the boat, uh, you know, the bigger the difference is going to be the more you're going to gain. Now, anyway, we're talking about the same thing, the speed going downwind. So VMG, we want to increase the VMG to go downwind as fast as possible. Then again, on these uh, catamarans, I figure out that most of the people in regattas, you know, they go zigzagging, they go for the speed. Well, I've always done one thing. I went the shortest way and opened all the sails, usually wing to wing. And that was the winning combination on the regattas. That's how we won uh, many regattas. So we were always going slow and short distance. Now, if you have a performance boat, which can, you know, pick up some, you know, really high speeds and you have a good set of sails, then probably this method is not going to work. But for these cruising catamarans, uh, it does. Now, the thing is, it's much more fun to go faster, right? You know, so. Uh, sometimes you just want to go a little bit more speed even though you get slower because that's the fun factor. Like who likes going very slow, you know, like be efficient? No, maybe it's not fun. You want to go a little bit faster. Anyway, this is VMG. We have this day winds, which is called here Maestral. And it's very useful to track the wind history, the angle and the speed. Because the day winds always tend to shift uh, in one direction, usually after the sun. And that's what we can actually see here, you see? The angle is increasing, which means that the winds are going, we call it, behind the sun. So afternoon, the winds are going to shift, you know, more to this direction. Now, uh, you should think about this because it could affect your tactics. Now, even if you don't have this, uh, you can kind of figure it out, you know, just naturally. And also the speed of the wind, uh, the day winds usually, you know, go up, up, up until a certain hour and then they slowly go down. And this is, uh, again, you know, a useful uh, thing to know uh, when the wind starts dropping and then, uh, you know, it might affect your tactics. So we talked about uh, apparent wind angle and the true wind angle. Now true wind angle is 46 apparent wind angle is 34. So we are, the boat is feeling the apparent wind angle. So this is the important, this is what the sails are feeling. Now we also have true wind speed and apparent wind speed. So we were talking about the angle, but now I'm talking about the speed. And you can see that the true wind speed is 12 knots, but apparent is 16. So how come? Well, we're going upwind. 
which means we are going kind of against the wind. And that's why we feel uh, more wind than it really is. It's very fun. Actually, we are kind of producing wind from, with our speed, but using the wind. It's a paradox, right? Now, if we turned more down to have the winds from 90 degrees, so this is, that would be like, you know, from here, then theoretically your true wind speed and apparent wind speed, they would be the same. And then once you start going downwind, you know, that we would turn uh, downwind this direction, then you're actually losing the wind. You're not producing it, but you're losing it. So when you go downwind, the apparent wind speed is going to be lower than true wind speed. But when going upwind, apparent wind speed is higher than the true wind speed. Basically, upwind, you are producing wind. Downwind, you are losing wind. And that's why you've noticed many times when you start sailing and you're going upwind, it's super windy, you're going fast. And then you turn around the corner and you start sailing downwind and then it becomes hot and everybody say, oh, where did the wind go? No, it's all about the same wind you just change your uh, direction. And now you're feeling much less because you're going with the wind, so you're losing kind of uh, the apparent uh, wind speed. So let's go through the setting of the main. So we've said we have uh, basically two controls. So one is this, left and right, which is really cool here. We just press this button, you see, and it moves. So it's called a traveler. And then you have uh, this line, which is the main sheet, which what it does is it pulls the boom down and makes the shape of the sail. So we could say that the traveler, you know, is adjusting the angle of the sail, like the angle to the wind. But the main sheet, especially on a catamaran, let's say on a monohull, you know, you have this vank, so it's a little bit different. We're talking now catamaran. Now this is gonna cause the boom to go out and up. So it has also a little bit of the effect of the traveler, so it does, you know, affect the angle of the wind to the sail, but most importantly, it affects the twist. So if you release the main sheet, the boom is going to go up, but then the sail on the top is going to open. So in light winds, that's how you're going to lose performance. In strong winds, is, uh, you're going to put much less pressure on the rig. So let's say now we have only, you know, a little bit of wind, so that's why we tangent the main sheet and that's how we close the upper part so we're catching a lot of wind and you know it's much more power and efficient now if the winds go up and you don't want to break everything you can either reef which means you know putting the sail a little bit down you know that's why those reefing lines are which we've talked already about uh, or if you don't want to reef you know you can just release the main sheet the boom is going to go up and out on the top, the twist is going to get bigger and you're going to be kind of spilling air. So you could, you know, really decrease the pressure on the rig. On the back of the sail, you can see these blue telltales. So ideally, you know, they want to go, you know, straight out, which means you have a nice flow of the air. And the top ones might go a little bit in uh, which tells you like you are really, uh, you know, like having a good power. Uh, so, uh, but you know what? Uh, the most important thing is speed. So adjust the sail the way that you have uh, the most speed. Uh, but these are the things you're watching basically. So you're using the traveler, main sheet, and then observe what the blue telltales are doing. But in the end, uh, the more the speed, then you're doing something right. So don't stick to the theory. If it doesn't work, just try to make the boat go faster. A little bit more advanced settings, uh, which are not really used much in the catamarans, would be tension of the sail in this way. Now, there is no option for this, but basically you would adjust the depth, how deep the sail is. So by pulling, you know, in this direction, the sail will get, you know, like more flat. But then if you release that line, you get more shape. It's just like, you know, on the airplane, when it's taking off, it puts those wings down, because this shape is gonna give him more lift. Uh, but then the faster you go, you don't need that much lift. So this is gonna be, you know, better shape. So it's the same, this is like a wing, it's just the same. And then you also play with the halyard. So this is the rope that's lifting the sail that puts the tension in the up direction, like up. And that's also another thing uh, that can adjust 
uh, the position of the stomach, so more forward or backwards. We call it a depth or a stomach, because it's like stomach. And also, you don't want to have this uh, too loose, because then you might get that line that actually goes like this, which will deform the sail a little bit. It depends from the, you know, the material. Uh, but yeah, um, like you want to have really kind of tangent, and in a strong wind, everything is going to stretch, so you have to tangent more. So you want to have, you know, kind of, uh, you know, no, how to say, not loose. It has to be tangent. Now, Genoa on this boat has this self-tacking, which, you know, I don't like. Uh, so what can you do? So we are actually, you know, using this uh, rope, which is a, you know, a jeep sheet. I keep confusing jeep and Genoa. Actually, this is more like jeep. The jeep would be, you know, a shorter sail. Like the Genoa, you know, would be longer. And then when they say Genoa 100, 10%, uh, 130, it's about how much of the Genoa goes, you know, behind. Uh, behind the shrouds. Now, so we can only set the the sheet of the jib. Uh, so if you release, the sail is going to open more, so we can go downwind or tension, and the sail is set more for upwind. Now we have these telltales, which are telling us what to do. So right now it's actually perfect. They're both kind of straight, uh, like the upper one is doing a little bit of trouble. Now, if I wanted to fix the upper one, which is now telling me, I should go more downwind or tension more the sail. Uh, I should change uh, the angle of the pull of the jeep more like in this way. So I could theoretically move this here, or maybe this one, and this would uh, you know work. But you're not going to do this because it's too much work. So just keep something in between. Now that's why I don't like you know this uh, self-tacking because on a normal boat you have the rail in this direction and you can move it. See, so right now I would move it a little bit forward and I would get this angle a little bit different so I could control the top of the sail also. Uh, so basically right now we are not able to control much. We just go by feeling and by speed. So speed is always going to tell you if you're doing something right or wrong. Now some people think that uh, using this, uh, see these are stoppers, which should never go all the way to the end. They always have to be, you know, in a, in a hole. Now, the people think that by putting them closer, which means, uh, let's look at this side. So, if you put it here, then the sail would be here. So, it would be more, you know, like, more in. And then people think, okay, this is going to be, you know, better, faster, more upwind sailing. Well, I mean, not on these uh, cruising boats, because you need a certain amount of angle of the sail to the boat. I actually forgot the number, I think it's around 40 degrees or something. So basically, if you put the sail directly here in the middle, the sail is not going to work, it's just physics. So uh, the more performance the boat has, you know, this might work on some high-tech boats, but for the cruising, you just want to, you know, uh, let it all the way out. Now, the problems on this boat, which I've talked in many videos, is that when going downwind, you see, this rail should be longer, uh, but you should check uh, my other videos for this. So, with a longer rail, you could, uh, you know, sail much more efficiently uh, in the other angles. Uh, and then we put an extra rope to that cleat. Another question is, we have quite light winds, actually they're just perfect. So, why are we not using our big, you know, light Genoa? I'm gonna call it light Genoa, some people call it call it code zero, but I call it light uh, Genoa. That was in the old days. Now, there's different shapes of these code zeros, light Genoa. So, it all depends how much, you know, like how deep it is, how much stomach it has. So, the deeper, the less upwind you can go, but, you know, more efficient in the other angles. Now, the, the less deep it is, the more upwind you can sail, uh, but, you know, less efficient downwind. Now, if you ask me, we have a perfect shape of this one, which is good up to 50 degrees apparent wind upwind which is really good but performs beautifully you know downwind you just want to have universal sail which is good for you know most of the things why would you have one sail light genoa for more upwind and then deeper one for downwind and lighter material stronger material uh, so this is just a perfect one it has a really good material it's not too light not too heavy uh, it's not fragile it's not like from fancy laminate and we can sail it up to 50 degrees apparent wind angle upwind. So this is the thing. 
we've just said that we're right now sailing at 35 upwind. So by opening the big sail, I mean, that would be great, you know, we would get more power, more surface area, that's great. But then we would have to go 15 degrees off. Now, in the end, we would be much slower upwind. If our direction was, this is island Vis, and down there it's Italy, one day sailing, if we would be going to Italy, we would just go, you know, like 20, 25 degrees off, open the big sail, and we would just fly, you know, full speed. Because the more surface area, the more power, the more speed. Now, of course, at some point, everything breaks, right? If you put too much power, something eventually fails. So that's why we are reefing and uh, you don't want to capsize the catamaran, which probably you won't, but uh, just saying that it's not about the maximum power, it's about you know, a good balance between safety and, uh, and the speed. There's another uh, control, so this is the line, and you can adjust it. So basically this line goes through all the way through the back edge. And you know, sometimes when you have a lot of wind, the sail starts you know, doing like this, like da 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 you know, too quickly, and it's just gonna wear it out. So that's when you can tension this, you know, to prevent this from happening. Uh, now, once you do this, uh, the back side of the sail does this, which is less efficient, you know. You theoretically want to have, you know, the sail, the wind go in and then straight out. Now, already here, you can see this is not the thing, you see. The sail goes in, but that kind of, you know, backs here. So this is not uh, like a perfect, perfect shape. Uh, but then again, if you pull this, you're going to get this even worse. And you can see on the main that the wind is uh, kind of, you know, backing into the front edge of the sail. But it's all fine, you know, this is not a uh, you know, racing boat. It's just, uh, we're just talking about principles. Now, if you're going to tension this too much, uh, you're going to have trouble when furling, it's just, you know, not going to be nice. So if you have tensioned it a lot in the strong winds, then you should release it a little bit before uh, furling the sail. Uh, or just find something that's good, you know, in between, which is uh, right now we don't have much vibrations. And also when we furl, it furls uh, quite nicely. So we'll, we won't touch this. Now another thing you want to pay attention is the boom lift. So see this rope that is loose? It's basically when you put the sail down, it prevents uh, the boom from falling onto the roof. Now, if you set it correctly, you don't have to touch it anymore. You see, now it's loose, but when we put the sail down, it's gonna prevent from, uh, you know, boom hitting the roof. Now, some people uh, play too much with it and then they set it wrongly, and then they either hit the roof, or when they're sailing, this is too much tangent, and then when you want to tension the main sheet, of course it doesn't work because you're putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on the boom lift. So just make sure when you're sailing the boom lift has to be loose and uh, it has to do its job when you put the sail down of preventing uh, the boom hitting the roof. So this boom lift is, uh, is this line. Actually it says backstage, not backstage, boom lift. Now there's a mark and uh, somebody probably marked it, you know, you don't want to go lose it more than this because then you're going to hit the, uh, the roof. I'm going to use this cleat to make sure nobody, you know, touches this rope. They're all the same color, so very quickly you pull the wrong one and then it's not going to be set uh, correctly anymore. But if it's here, even if I pull, it doesn't happen. And then if I release, you see, it also doesn't go in the other way, so it's kind of a, a good way of protecting uh, your uh, boom lift from other people playing with it or yourself you know these are all the same color so very quickly you go wrong there is the effect of the islands on this wind especially when you're in croatia always close uh, to land so the more out you are you know the nicer winds we have now the question is we have these islands in front of us so it's uh, right here so the question is how far and so how close to the islands we want to go before taking out and it's basically as long as you have good winds, you know, keep going. It's kind of nice to go close to the islands. If you would be racing, you would stay more further out. But now we just want to get close to see them. And then as soon as you feel that the winds are kind of, uh, I call them, they get dirty. You can kind of smell them. It's just the feeling you'll get with time. So you're going to feel like there's wind, but it's turbulent. And it's kind of, you know, not like 
steady, it's not uh, constant. And you can really feel it and you can also smell because once the winds go across the island, they get different smell and they also change the speed. Like mostly you will notice something strange because your boat is gonna lose speed. And then uh, once this happens, it's a good you know, sign to tack and go out away from the islands. Down there, Vis, we were there, a beautiful island. Now these are Pakleni Islands, just in front of the Huar, where we were uh, yesterday. And just to say again, I've talked about this, but just to remind you, you see, be careful here. This rope always needs to be a little bit tangent or like this, never all the way loose, because it can fall be between here and if you don't see it when you start furling, you are gonna damage uh, uh, the rope. So always be aware. So that uh, black furling line goes all the way around. And then comes out here. Yeah, so these stoppers, what they do, I just like gently, you see, pull very gently. If you pull too much, then there's gonna be a lot of strength on this rope because you already kind of furled the sail. So it has to be, you know, kind of loose, but tangent and stopper closed. And then always before furling from here, you know, just take a look if it does make sense uh, or just go forward and double check it. Flying our big light Genoa again. And what amazing sail this is. And we've talked about this one already. It's just like you can go 50 apparent wind angle upwind. You can go downwind. Always keeps the great shape and the material. You know, it's not too deep uh, cut. So it's perfect, but it works perfectly for downwind also. And it's a very good material. It's uh, a nice like high tech material, but it's not, as we said, it's not a fragile laminate. You know, it's kind of, you see, it's, uh, you can, you know, like it's a, it's a work sale, you know. It's gonna last for a long time and it's meant to be used daily. And we have this uh, UV protection here. We're having very light winds. Now you can see it's slowly dying. But with this sail, see, we can still keep going. And we go pretty fast. Let's see on the bows. See, we're moving. Like in front of us, there's a catamaran just under engine because he doesn't have this light Genoa. You can see that the speed behind is very decent and very little wind. I'm so happy with this sail. So we have a full main, this light Genoa, and let's see what the instruments are saying. So we're actually doing uh, 5.7 knots, and there's only 11 knots of true wind speed, and actually only 10 of apparent, so this is what the sails feel. So in 10 knots of apparent wind speed, we're doing six knots. This is uh, really good. We're also having a really good wind angle, you see. We could go even faster if we went a little bit, you know, a couple degrees, but anyway, this is the sweet spot. This is where we get the most uh, speed out of the catamarans. Okay, 6.2. See, the winds went a little bit up. So we could call this like, you know, medium winds, uh, but without this sail, we would be doing much less speed. That's just beautiful. Another interesting thing is now that uh, the difference between apparent wind angle and true wind angle is much bigger. So the less the wind and the more performance the boat or the more the sail, the biggest the difference gets. Because now in light winds, we are reaching uh, very high speeds. So the speed affects, uh, you know, this uh, difference much more. Uh, let's just say if we had uh, you know, if you have 30 knots of wind and you're doing five, or you have 10 knots and you're doing five, you know, proportionally, this difference, uh, you know, uh, affects this difference. So in strong winds, you know, these two guys come pretty much together. In low winds, you're gonna get a much bigger difference. Now, this is very important because let's say we wanna go upwind and the true wind is already from here. So a parent is very quickly be saying we're sailing upwind. So if I try to simplify this, even if you have the true wind from the side of the boat and then you put, and it's, you have very light winds, let's say just eight knots, 
and you put all the sails up, you pick up the speed of around four knots, the boat is gonna feel like sailing upwind. You know, all of the winds are from here, but because you produce speed, it's gonna feel like this. Now, the more the wind there is, uh, the less this effect is uh, obvious. Uh, but then, of course, in very strong winds, you're not gonna fly light Genoa. Uh, you're gonna have just a jib, but it's the same principle. So the stronger the wind, uh, the less difference between true and apparent. So again, why is this important? Let's say, okay, we plan our day. We know the winds are from here. And, uh, you know, we think we can go upwind like this. Not really, because actually we're going to be going like this. So it does uh, mean a lot, especially if you want to use this light Genoa. Now, if you're just using, uh, you know, the jib, you can achieve, you know, 35 apparent wind angle. Uh, but with the light Genova, you can go 50, which is actually really good. But still, with the jib, you can go, you know, point higher. Now, why the jib can point higher, 15 degrees more than the light Genova? If you would say, what's the point? It's all the same. Well, the thing is that, uh, you see, the light Genova is just has, you know, much bigger stomach. And it goes from outside, from the shrouds, right? So when you're tensioning it, see? After you tension, you see this angle is gonna be much bigger. Like on the jib, when you tension, it's all the way here. Now you could theoretically put this line and make a attachment point here. So that would give you a couple more meters. And then, yeah, theoretically you could go a little bit more uh, upwind. We anchored in this beautiful Uvala Blaza on the island branch. The sun just set, so the colors I'll have to show you tomorrow. But you can see it's a very small bay and it's nicely protected from the winds. And also the hills are pretty high, so that's why the sun is already behind. So we have two lines behind going ashore and we drop uh, the anchor. Now, the key thing here is Okay, it's a very small bay and you have to drop a lot of anchor. So in the middle it's 10 meters, but then on the edges it would be around, you know, 5-6 meters depth. Now coming in, luckily there was not much wind, but it was from the side. Which means it's the tricky because it's, you know, kind of drifting you sideways. So what we did is, we went all the way to the other side with the boat. And we dropped the anchor almost on those rocks. And then we dropped 30 meters of chain as going backwards slowly. And then once we were like over the middle with the boat, I stopped dropping the chain and just went with the boat to tension it. You know, that the anchor would dig and then everything tensions. If you don't do this, you know, if you just keep going backwards and then you come here and then uh, the chain is not stretched and then you're going to be using the winch, you know, to tension the chain to figure out what's going on. It's not the best. So the best is to drop, you know, something like, you know, 20, 30 meters and then stretch it with the boat, so not letting down the chain. The anchor is going to, you know, dig a little bit and then keep going. And then I dropped them more. I dropped like 25 more, so the chain was really loose. Uh, went all the way to the back. We had these lines ready. So the line ready means that it's 50 meter one. We actually put it all the way in the deck up and down. So there's like no way it's going to get uh, tangled. And now we're using these, uh, these loops. This is something new. It's actually used for, you can order on Amazon, it's used for trucks or something. It actually floats, you know, it's very durable, so it doesn't uh, uh, get damaged on the rocks. You don't want to use the rope on the rocks because it'll damage it, right? Previously, I was using just the chains, which are great, uh, but they don't float. I mean, they're more durable, but this seems to be just a great uh, solution. So we are having now two lines, so we want to have two lines, you know, just in case one, uh, you know, would fall off or anything. And they're at slight angle. Now it would be much better to have a bigger angle. So this one here and this one going a little bit further down. But as we're expecting zero winds, you know, it'll be just fine. In very strong winds, you do want to have these angles like, you know, 40 degrees, 40 degrees or 45, 45, uh, you know, to be more uh, efficient. But we're just uh, fine like this. 
So then we had one person here helping with the rope. I came all the way in the back. Uh, one person jumped in. We already picked the spot. So he was there in one minute or 30 seconds. He puts around the rock with tension. And then we stopped uh, drifting. Now you do this only with, you know, like a little bit more experienced crew. Uh, now another thing I did is, so I'm using this cleat again. This is basically the safety when the anchor is up. But I'm using it again because I want to put the pressure, you see, off the winch. Uh, it's just like a safety feature and we don't want to uh, torture the winch too much. So just like very easy to use uh, this line. Now when anchoring uh, like this, usually we don't use the Y. You definitely want to use this when anchoring, you know, just anchoring. Uh, but it would be pretty tricky, you know, to set it because like you don't know the distance, right? So it would be, you know, trial and error. And uh, in the end, because the boat is not going to be moving much left and right, and we already have two lines behind, you know, kind of preventing this, and then there is no need uh, for the Y. And also in case uh, something goes wrong during the night, you know, it's going to be much uh, easier and quicker to lift the anchor up without messing up with this. But you do want to put the pressure of the winch with, with that line. Now this kind of anchoring is, uh, it's safe, it's good. I mean, definitely in uh, low winds and winds coming from the front or from the back of the boat. Now, if you get really strong winds coming from the side, uh, it's actually gonna put a tremendous pressure on the anchor and it's probably gonna slip. What to do if you expect strong winds? Well, definitely, you know, you don't wanna get them from a 90 degree angle. Uh, if you know where the winds are going to come, like in Croatia, we know storms come mostly, you know, from, you know, from west angles. You could, you know, let's say if the storm is coming from there, then I would go on the other side so that I'm pulled away from the shore. So that I'm more or less uh, using the back lines, you know, against the wind. And then uh, the anchor is holding just a little bit the bow. And then I would point the back of the boat, you know, as much as... Uh, up um, like towards the wind as I expect so that the force is uh, the wind is not going to be perpendicular but at kind of the angle uh, so that's the most you can do and another thing is always drop a lot a lot of chain you know right now we dropped 35 uh, meters and we dropped it on uh, 6 meters but then there's 10 meters and right now we have 6 meters depth now just drop as much as you can you know uh, so I went really all the way to the other side and once you drop the anchor it always you know takes you know like four or five meters before it you know digs in so you really want to pu like put it like as much as on the other side now don't put it if you know the bottom is too steep you know because then it goes usually like this so make sure you find a good spot uh, in Croatia it's very easy because uh, you can see to the bottom you see here it's six meters and you can see the bottom very clearly uh, so yeah it's uh, it just put too much chain and this is the best guarantee that you're gonna be floating in the morning another thing i really like uh, these uh, cleats that we've put on the boat is that now i can add uh, you know a fender which is much more forward so when you're docking sideways you want to protect the boat so usually you would just you know put this one but then you see there's a meter and a half which is kind of not protected and pretty hard to mount any fender forward. Uh, but now using this cleat, you know, I can very easily have another fender more forward and it's, you know, so easy. I still, you know, put it here so I can lower it or put it up if necessary, but uh, it's so good. Now I have a bigger surface protected, much safer to dock. We have a, a buoy here, which is now again, uh, a new system it's hard to see but there is a very very thick line going like like this size with a loop and then the small line and the container which is holding this uh, uh, line up so you have to lift it and put your ropes through so now why do we have um, three ropes so we have this one and another side and then we have the middle one so there's a thing when we came it was supposed to be very calm and when it's very calm you know, this one is usually enough. Although, you know, Lagoon would say this is not, you know, strong point, you know, and things. But then why is it here? You know, why is the cleat here? So from my experience, you know, this is pretty strong. 
you know. And also this part, it's much stronger than it looks and many times I've used just this, especially if it's you no know, really, really uh, low winds, calm nights like we have in Croatia. Now, the thing is that, uh, so recently when I was putting these lines and they would get very loose because there's no winds, they would for some reason cut on the dinam and you can actually see there was some friction. So what we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna put a hose to protect the dinema and then uh, we'll be able to use, you know, just these two lines from the side, which are, of course, better. But still, you know, if it's really calm night, you know, you'll be just fine uh, using this one. So what we did yesterday is we just put this one, but then the storm started and there was quite a lot of storms around. There was some wind, so just in case, you know, we would be hit by a storm we put uh, two more lines, but then I just, you know, left this one because in case the winds would really drop, then I can always just tension the one in the middle and then there's going to be no friction on, uh, on this one to the dinema. Looking at the cleats from inside, so this is the one, the original one on the side, you can see that uh, this is really thick and there's a big, this is like a uh, half centimeter a very strong, you know, back plate and, you know, this is really strong and you do need this strong because you would use this for tying to the dock and you can get, you know, very high forces. Now, the one that, uh, you know, was added, this one in front, uh, but it's not back plate, so that's, I'm not sure why, like, uh, you know, probably would be better that the guy who was installing would put, you know, a little bit bigger uh, stainless uh, uh, plate. But for some reason, it's just like this. So now, I would say... I hope this is pure fiberglass. If this is pure fiberglass, so like no foam, then this is very strong. So now in the worst case, uh, if we pull this cleat out, it's gonna be very small damage here. So it's gonna be very easy uh, to fix. But now I'm just looking, it just seems like, uh, you see, this is definitely foam sandwich. Uh, this is definitely not, so this is a joint between the deck and the hull, so it might be, I'm not sure, but hopefully in forward it's only fiberglass and then it's gonna be okay, because you know, if there's a foam and you, you know, tension a lot, the screws and everything, the foam, you know, can, you know, it's, it's kind of, it can be soft, uh, so we'll see what the time shows. This is the one that we added and I mean it's just a great functionality It's exactly when you need it And uh, we'll be using it a lot now. We're not gonna use this one for very high forces When tying to the dock, so it's gonna be mostly for the buoys and when you have a buoys and uh, The rope is very long you see there's not so much force because the line is gonna stretch and the buoys, they're not like, you know, tying to the dock when you get, you know, like really, you know, strong movements, you know, it's much softer. So I believe, you know, we had uh, 30 knots already on these cleats and they were not moving at all. So I just have a good feeling that, uh, it's another one on this side, I have a good feeling that this is going to work uh, really well. We have these holders uh, for the stand-up boards. And I kind of uh, like them, you know, it's uh, look, just basic, you see, just, uh, you know, stainless steel and it's attached uh, down there and it's, uh, it's really good, it's really good. And then, uh, you know, just put a rope around, it works really well. Like, unfortunately, they came uh, without these caps, which we've added. And we're gonna need a couple more, so we're also using this for the board. And it's actually really good and nobody's hitting, it's uh, very functional. So they came like this. So we just put these uh, covers which are used uh, for the chairs. So we're lucky to be able to find them. And yeah, I think this is, oh, this is a little bit clumsy. So we'll probably have to adjust the screws down there. But uh, anyway, it's a pretty good uh, solution. I'm still uh, really happy with these solar panels. So we have around 900 watts here. And uh, yeah, I it's, it's, uh, still really like it. This boat is Laguna 46. 
and I kind of, you know, like it uh, more and more, you know, for like sailing Croatia in charter. I just, you know, it looks really good. I love this flybridge. And now with this uh, water maker we have, we solve the problem of water in Croatia. Most of the boats don't have water maker, not easy to get water. And now we have solved the problem with electricity because again, most of the charter boats don't have solar panels. So you have all the time problem with batteries. So what happens is, you know, during the night, uh, you would use, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, fridges, so the batteries get low. And if you have normal gel or acid batteries, once you go under 60%, you kind of start destroying them, right? Which uh, usually people don't care much on the charter, so in one or two years those batteries are really bad. It's getting worse and worse. But now with solar panels, you see, as soon as the sun is up, which is very early, we start, you know, generating electricity and also all afternoon, if you're anchored, see, we're producing electricity. So every charter boat should have solar panels and should have a water maker. I think this one we have is around 5,000 euros. So it's relatively low cost for how important it is and to the value of the boat. We are anchored in the Blue Lagoon, Kirtnjoshi, Otok Drvenik Veli. It's a very nice lagoon, but you need the sun. See, it's very cloudy. So the colors are a little dull, very popular place. But what I wanted to say is, if you look carefully, as you can see this one area is much brighter. Uh, so the dark area is grass and your anchor is not gonna hold really well in grass. So what we did is, you can actually maybe see our anchor is uh, right down there. We have dropped the anchor into the sand. So we were looking for this uh, bright spot and you want to drop your anchor there because it's going to hold uh, way better. Now, if you drop it in the grass, it might not hold. Uh, and, uh, you know, initially it might hold, but then, you know, just going to pick up the grass, pull everything out. So it's good, you know, to look for a good spot. So if you look around, we have a grass and then maybe on the other side, there's another spot where we could drop. See, it's all grass here. But then there's a bright spot, so it's good to think uh, about the ground. Now, another thing is how hard or soft the ground is. So I can see here it's kind of sand, so the uh, anchor will, you know, dig in. But it could be also a very rocky bottom. And on the rocky bottom, the anchor doesn't dig in. It just, you know, hooks for the rock. Now, is it going to hold? It's not going to hold. Now, if it holds, if it hooks for a very big rock, and it's going to definitely hold, but you might not be able to get it uh, out. You know, you'll have to dive and unhook it. So it's uh, very important, you know, the type of the ground. So sometimes it's a little bit muddy and that's a really good hold. You might have trouble, you know, getting it out because like vacuum, you know, it really holds, you know, hard to get it out. You will get it out, uh, but a really good hold. So the sand is good. If the sand is too fine, you know, it might, you know, you know, kind of, you know, go through slowly. The grass is not good. So you have to pay attention where you drop and what, how, you know, type of the bottom, how soft, how hard it is. And then we have also talked about the length of the chain. So we have around the three meters depth here and I have dropped 20 because it was kind of stormy out there. So yeah, let's just put, you know, a little bit more. It's always better. Uh, although now if it's calm, you know, we could just drop, you know, like 15 meters or something, it would be plenty. So the general rule is you want to go three to five times the depth. So if it's calm, you want to go three times the depth. So here theoretically it would be nine enough. But there's a thing, when you go very shallow, you see, I always go more, you know. I always go at least 15, I did 20 now, you know, that's like kind of minimum you want to drop. But then let's say if there was... Uh, you know, let's say five meters depth, uh, then I would probably drop, you know, 20. In the high winds, uh, I would go five times, which would be, you know, 25, but then I would go a little bit more, you know, probably 30, 35. Um, but um, yeah, the general rule is uh, three to five times the depth. So now we can see our anchor actually here. This is our anchor, it's kind of funny. And then just next to it, you can see these are the concrete blocks. So this is somebody's buoys, uh, but there's no buoy, you know, just a concrete block. Uh, just the weight, you know, when the rope goes and then keeps the boat in the place. Now you can see very clearly that the anchor is not digged in. So you're just now standing on the floor. 
because we didn't uh, you know go reverse to dig it in what you want to do uh, sometimes just to make sure it digs so now with a strong wind it would take a while until it digs in a couple meters and now the better the anchor the quicker you know it sets this is delta and i'm you know pretty happy with this one now if you expect really strong winds then you can you know reverse the boat and you know dig the anchor just to make sure it's digged and it's holding really well but now you can see only the chain is holding us so this is our anchor and then you can see the chain goes now under the boat see and then well we'll see it's grassy here so probably won't see it on the bottom anyway yeah then the chain goes around see comes back to our boat it's because of the currents and there's no wind so we're just kind of drifting left and right but it's just kind of cool to see your anchor here because everybody would think you know your anchor is out there somewhere well now it's here and we can see also now a difficult situation in case the winds would shift from there you know strong winds and then uh, the boat would turn the boat would go all the way down of course because the chain has to stretch and pivot around the anchor so the anchor in this case could hook for that concrete block uh, which is uh, which could be good for the hold or really hard to get the anchor out but it's you know very you, you can think this as a big rock uh, so that's you know can cause a problem so it's very shallow here so that's why it's advisable to anchor at the depth that you can uh, dive so in case it hooks you can just dive here it's three meters it's easy if you anchor on 20 meters it might be you know too much you might get in trouble or have to release all the chain and come back uh, for it later it's kind of a lazy cloudy day but we're gonna get much more sun uh, so it's a good time you know it's not hot to do some improvements on the boat so this hose which is really really cool see it's uh, the one that's stretching but it has this uh, on the both end and it's really hard to fill uh, up the tanks so i just did uh, this small adapter so just hook it in here and then it's uh, very easy to fill up the water uh, you can just leave it there because now we had to stand there and keep it with a hand and then there's a couple of improvements uh, on the dinghy so now we have a uh, pure stainless steel here uh, before it was this this is just a sink it lasts you know for a month or two but then it's it doesn't work you know on the boat you need uh, like stainless steel it's the only thing that's uh, gonna work and now we have put these uh, fenders here just to keep you know the distance uh, from the boat when the dinghy is up uh, previously we had these attached uh, as a dinghy fenders and now we have these uh, red fenders which i found them uh, super cool and we always want to protect our dinghy not many people have fenders on a dinghy but i find them uh, super cool and efficient and these are really cool they are pretty cheap it's uh, 10 euro one it's actually not a fender but it's something you know to hold like a fishing net up or whatever but it's you know the same thing as a fender and if it's uh you know the thin one you don't get the distance but with these guys you really get you know distance far from uh, the pier and then your rubber doesn't get damaged it does make a huge difference so this is the investment of you know 60 euros in the boat uh, but it's gonna look uh, much better for a longer time then we have one in front so why is this one here you know of course when you crash you know directly uh, you're gonna see it's already scratched here and here now this one is gonna prevent uh, these marks and then another thing is because you see these tubes go like this they go a little bit up like many times you know the boats get damaged here when you go onto the pier or people are not uh, careful but now this one is also gonna prevent uh, a lot of this another thing is the knot i use to tie a dinghy so many people will, will just make you know like any knot or they would put a bowline but if it's just you know a bowline so just going through without uh, adding this you see then it's kind of uh, you know the rope gets damaged much more now with this one when it's tangent you see there's much less uh, movement especially the more it gets tangent the better it is so you can see you see if the, it's doing like this you see there's like much less movement here now on the other hand if you wouldn't have this so whenever you would move you know the rope would go zigzag zigzag so this is a good method uh, it just saves the rope for uh, uh, way longer 
Another good thing to have on a dinghy is the anchor. So that's what many people don't have. So we do have an anchor. So when you go on the pier, you know, just drop an anchor. And uh, you know, you don't want to leave your dinghy just banging what most of the people do. They just tie a dinghy and then go and the poor dinghy is crashing, gets damaged. You know, you have to mind about your dinghy. So definitely have the fenders. Uh, you need an anchor. And then uh, we also have one rope set here already. So this is uh, one line. So you're gonna use this one so in case you wanna go, you know, sideways to the pier. And then you already have, you know, one rope here, one is in front. You put fenders, you can also use uh, two more fenders from the other side. And then the boat, you know, is gonna be, you know, stable. It's gonna stay in the same place. It's not gonna turn and crash into something. So these are just small things that I think they're really worth uh, doing it. It's gonna save your dinghy. It's gonna look nicer. And then another thing is here. Okay, I'll put this down. So I always put a carabin on the end of the, is this called painter or whatever? It's holding the boat. And I always put the one that has uh, this hole. So you can have one without a hole or with a hole. So basically, now whenever you come to the boat and you want to hook it somewhere, uh, okay, let's just use this one. You see, you can just hook it. It takes, uh, you know, one second. And it's uh, definitely, your shirt sure is going to hook, it's going to hold. And when people are doing it, which are not, you know, used to the knots, you see, it's like either yes or not, you know, you cannot go wrong, but you can do a wrong knot and then your dinghy, you know, is going to go away. Now, if there is no point like this, you can just use, you know, anything. So you would go around and then you would uh, hook it, see, for the, your rope and you get this, see? And you cannot go wrong. You see, there's no way anybody can do this and you're not going to lose your dinghy. And then the same when you get uh, to the pier, to the dock. Like many times there's an option that you can just hook or you go around and hook. So it's much faster. It's uh, kind of safer, you know. And another good thing is that, uh, so the length of this line, like many times people, uh, you know, start going planing. This rope is not secured here, falls in the water, goes into the propeller. So one option is that the length of this rope is like, see, this much. So now it's probably not, shouldn't get in the propeller uh, because the distance, you see, is like, it just has to be shorter. Now, having this uh, heavy carabine here uh, adds safety because in a case, see, this falls in the water, it's heavy, so it's kind of going to be a little bit deeper. But, well, don't count on that. Uh, but the third thing is, you know, you just hook it here, see, that's it. So whenever you go, you hook it here. So there's no way it's going to fall in the water. Some people, you know, do some kind of wraps, which are okay, it takes time. But look how easy this is. You see, you come here, hook for the boat, then you want to go, see, just uh, hook it here, just with one hand, and you cannot go wrong. And then a couple of improvements on the stand-up pedal. So now, as I've said, we have this, uh, which are really good, and we put these uh, covers. And then, you see, you just use these ropes to attach. So we have one rope here. So you just go across. It's so easy, like in the strong winds. I mean, even without this rope, it's probably not going to fall off. And then we have another rope uh, here. Uh, but then, you know, people put it in the water and then you lose it because they don't know how to make a knot. So it's a very easy solution, just like with a dinghy. This is the carabine. You need the one with a hole. And then uh, it's attached here. Now don't use this for pulling uh, behind the dinghy. You know, especially sometimes they're in front. And I guess they don't put the, the one in front because people, you know, then uh, pull this thing behind the dinghy and it gets broken. This is, you know, strong, but not strong enough to be pulled behind, just glued on, you know. So you put uh, this paddle in the water and then again, you know, just hook it somewhere for the boat. See, it's very easy. Anybody can do it, especially kids, or as you said, you can go around, see, and hook like this. And you see, it doesn't fail. Anybody can do this. Uh, it's a really uh, good method. Uh, I've removed this one. So originally you have this one here that goes around an ankle. I removed it uh, with a reason. The first thing is when you're stand up paddling in Croatia, you really don't you know, need that. But if you have, 
then people would use, I'll show you here, they would use this to attach it to the boat, which is, you know, sounds, you know, like uh, really good. So you have, see this. So people would put around somewhere and, you know, do this. The problem is many people don't do this, which is good. People would just go and do this, right? Okay, it's holding, but then suddenly it's not holding anymore. So that's why I just removed it and make sure uh, it doesn't go wrong. And so with these carabines, you know, we just hook it around, usually around the ladder, click, clip, clip, and we've never lost any of these boards. Another improvement is uh, here. So, you see, now I put elastic here. So let's just say in case when you don't have uh, the light Genoa on, and then you are, somebody crashes in your pin on. So if you, if you have a strong rope here, you see, it's just gonna, you know, break. If you have an elastic cord, you see, it has like more movement, you know, it can go up and down. Uh, so it's much better. Another thing is, you see, uh, this is the Y for the anchor, the line. It's the one you hook uh, for the chain when you're anchoring, which we're not using now because it's for low winds. In high winds, you definitely want to use to put uh, the strength of the winch, windlass, and to stabilize the boat so it's not going left and right. Anyway, so sometimes the boat goes over, you know, the chain goes behind, and then you get a pull on these Dynema lines. And this can be, you know, pretty strong. Now with this cord, it's very safe because the Dynema is just gonna, you know, loop. You know, it's, uh, it's not gonna break, you know, it's not gonna be stiff because the pinon will be able to go down. This is gonna stretch, so it's like a safety feature. But yeah, of course, when you have the light Genoa up, you see, it's, uh, it doesn't help. See, this doesn't do much because the Genoa is holding it up. But when you do put it down, you know, for safety reasons, uh, it's uh, very useful. Well, there's another advantage of having uh, two ropes already attached in a dinghy, I think I've said. So we use this one to attach it there, and then the front one we use to attach on that side. So when you have a strong waves, you know, the boat uh, doesn't move, so it's really stiff here. And uh, these ones, you know, this will prevent a boat, you know, rubbing against the boat, keeps the distance, so it looks like a very good solution now. And another really cool thing we have is this chair. Well, it looks like a chair, but it's a really super one. You see, so it's kind of, you see, click, but then you go up. No, I have to go like, break, see? And then you can have a seat and you have the best uh, backrest. And this one is like, it's really strong. I mean, you've seen these things, they're usually kind of soft, but this one is really strong. And I can tell you, this is like, uh, this is like more uh, comfortable than uh, this one. Uh, when plugging electricity in these uh, things, you should always, you know, wrap a couple of turns around uh, because if somebody hooks, you know, the leg somewhere, uh, just uh, usually here, uh, there's just less chances you're gonna pull it out and uh, bend it. Having these fenders here when coming to the nice marinas like this is really like essential and very helpful because when you reverse, you can just, uh, you know, think like a catamaran as uh, the third side, you know, not like uh, left and right, but just as another one. And this fender is just, you know, gonna protect you. So you can go all the way in the back, especially on this one, because you don't see uh, very well from the flybridge. So having a, you know, well-positioned fender, you know, you can just go all the way to the back and don't worry about hitting. Another good trick is uh, when the boats are, see, like this, uh, like sardines, we all have mooring lines, is to put these uh, fat fenders. If you have only the skinny fenders, you know, they tend to do a lot of noise because they would go, you know, up and down. So when the boats move gently, see, they move and they kind of, you know, squeak and they can have a lot of noise on this one, it starts moving. So what I do is uh, you can put this, uh, a big fender, which is basically rolling, so it's doing much less noise. And I put it on this cleat, because if you put it here, even though you can put it here, which is better, you know, it can make like, you know, noises, but then just put it to the strong uh, point. And I did the same on the other side. And it really helps a lot uh, with uh, silence at night. If the boats are not moving, it's good. But as soon as you have a little bit of swell, you know, uh, you do get a lot of noise. So you can see I did the same on this side, 
and it's a really good trick. So we are in uh, Marina Maslnica, which is a very nice uh, place uh, to visit on island Sholta. And today we're just using two mooring lines in front and then we have two lines in the back. We didn't put the spring lines because the boats are like sardines anyway. Uh, but well, we probably should put them because if one boat goes out, then the boat will start swinging left and right, and then you could use uh, lose the board. And then it starts moving, and then very quickly it just uh, falls into the water. Uh, but because uh, we knew there's going to be boats and we we're going to be the first one leaving, we were just lazy and didn't put the spring lines. But you really want to do it. Now the plan uh, how to exit the marina. So the first thing is we want to check when the, where the wind is coming from. So we could say it's coming a little bit from the side, so we can just assume it's coming from uh, see that side. Why is this important? Once we start going out, you see, we can expect to be drifted here. And you can see the problem here. So this boat has, see, mooring lines, but this is just normal. See, all the boats have them. And also on the other side, you'll see there's more uh, mooring lines. See, these ones are a little bit more further away. So we're being, being pushed like this. So that's what we have to uh, think about. Now, if you go uh, very fast, you're not going to drift. If you go slowly, you're going to drift more. Now, if you go fast, you're going to break more in case you hook something. If you go slow, you're not going to break, but you see, you might finish here with a rudder. Now, so what's the trick? So basically now we can put, see, all the lines off and mooring lines off and the boat is still going to be see, squeezed between these boats. Uh, now the thing is, when you put throttle forward, uh, you have to be careful not to hook the boat somewhere. Now these fenders, you know, tend to kind of, you see, like hook, especially when you're uh, like sardines. So having a fat fender there on the back, then just sometimes, you know, it's hard to go out. So there's one trick, uh, you can maybe put all your fenders up and use just the fenders from the other boat or just have a couple of yours uh, helping you how to go out. Sometimes problems with the big ones in the back uh, going out, you know, just they get hooked. Especially if you're really squeezed together, there's just uh, no space. So that's what you have to think. Sometimes the boats have uh, engines mounted, like this one has on the back. Now, if this boat had engine mounted, like the small outboard, and sticking out, that's another thing you want to look for. So, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm probably just going to keep as it is. It's looking pretty good, it's not so squeezed. It's just, uh, you know, you have to think what you're going to do, what the plan is. So, what we're going to do is, we're just going to, you see, release all the ropes, everything. And then I'm going to use the throttles to twist the boat. So left one forward, right one backwards to get this angle. So upwind a little bit. And to do this, I have to protect my uh, back. You see, so I'm going to put the big fender, keep it there. So now I can twist the boat, see, and bounce from this sailboat. And that's how I'm going to get a little bit better angle uh, to avoid these mooring lines. So once I twist the boat, I'm just going to go out relatively quickly uh, because I checked there's nothing to be hooked and you know the quick is the way to go but yeah if you mess it up it's going to hurt more. You can see the space now, it's just the right size. Many boats are a nice place here in Marina Maslnica. It's one of the nicest marinas, one of the nicest people. Uh, like, I love this marina, it's really good. So what I did, because I didn't have camera up here. So basically we first release the mooring lines, make sure they're in the water. See, you don't want to have them hooked from the fenders on anything, because then you'll uh, get them in the propeller. Then we, see, release the back lines. And there was like absolutely no hurry because there was not much wind. Even if there was wind, you know, we were kind of stuck between the two monohulls and there is a you know, very nice uh, pier. We have protection there with our fender, so no hurry. So once all the ropes are set, then I twisted the boat. So what I did is I put this engine forward, this one a bit backwards. 
so the boat twists and once I had the angle upwind then I give like quite a lot of push see I wasn't like gentle I go like vroom, to get initial speed and slow down once I see everything is good it's okay then I need a little bit more speed so I give another push vroom, stopped so the boat has momentum is going out and then also I went to check see I just left everything I went to check everything is going okay but we had enough momentum to get out and then so it was very easy no winds when there's no winds it's easy the strong winds you have to think a little bit more because you can make more damage you see so this is why we're using this rope to attach the boom so that it's not you see dancing there's a little bit you see loose down there of course you could tension the main sheet a little bit more well, it's not gonna solve the problem it's gonna make it a little bit better uh, but that's why you want to use this we have great conditions today right now we have 23 knots of true in speed and going uh, kind of downwind and look at the speed it's 7.6 it was 7.8 earlier and we're gonna go from far to this so now we're sheltered we have south winds once we go around it's gonna get more rough for nine miles but should be a very nice uh, sail as we expect more winds uh, we checked here so we put one reef uh, we might get uh, out without one reef but it's always better to put it easier to you know put the sail up than to reduce uh, when it gets uh, really bad okay we're going 8.4 25 knots of true in speed so it's good that we reefed eight knots it's really good it's always uh, fun when the water is calm see we're sheltered now by the island but very quickly we're gonna get around and it's gonna get more rough i guess people in front are gonna get wet so we have a full genoa and we have one reef uh, on the main so this is a single line system so basically what you do is you first release the halyard so the sail goes down and then you have to tension the reef which is basically this rope that is gonna do this you see so it's gonna pull the sail down here this is the rope going here and then it goes through the boom and then it does the same on the back of the sail so it's just one line that basically goes like this and then like this so it's holding the sail down now we have another reef the second one so we could release the halyard put the sail low and then tension the second line which would do again the same you see like pull the sail here and there so this is the reef it's pretty easy now i am a fan of uh, double line reefing system which means you have one line just for that corner and just one line for this corner uh, now this is a single line system which means you have one line for both corners which is uh, I mean very rarely better uh, it has a lot of friction so just not a big fan of it but we have a nice shape today a lot of boats out there so whenever you see you know boats just running a Genoa which most of them are that means it's windy and nobody wants to bother with the mainsail beautiful speed behind so this is the sailing everybody likes no waves but lots of wind but it's gonna change very quickly once we get around the corner it's gonna be fun we're gonna wash the boat a little bit unfortunately salt water what a day so this is an interesting strategy just have a mainsail and this usually just doesn't work on the catamaran so you have to run engines and the main probably better off uh, with the Genoa anyway you can see not many people sailing for real that lagoon 42 just running engines on a, such a beautiful day and we're just gliding we still have so we're just averaging over eight knots all the time 20 knots of true in speed what a day now we have much better angle it's from the side which is optimum so we're reaching 8.8 .8, like steadily should be nine very soon.
9 knots, okay. 9.1, so just constant speed of 9 knots. So this boat does perform when you get this good angle. So these catamarans, when you have these angles, they do sail, it's fun. When you go upwind, not so much fun. When you have straight downwind, not so much fun. But, you know, just plan the day so that you have nice uh, winds. Now we're gonna try to squeeze between here. Uh, but then you never know, you see the winds might be, you know, because winds are like this. So it might be no wind or you hope it doesn't go in or whatever. Maybe, you know, help with the engine, but it's much better. Uh, we want to keep the height, right? We don't want to go down and then come up. So we'll try to squeeze through here to have a better angle later. We'll see how it goes. Still flying over eight knots constantly, eight and a half. Now we're slowly starting to feel the land effect. You see, we're just uh, 0 0.7 mile from the land. And now we'll have to squeeze uh, through here. Now you never know exactly what's gonna happen. So be ready to start the engines because uh, there's a lot of shallows and once we get through we'll get more waves this is the Khwar channel the famous Khwar up there the city and what a beautiful day for sailing just flying now the speed dropped we're getting some dirty winds you can see a lot of gusts you see like a different color would mean a different gust and now we'll see this is the narrow part it's shallow it's tricky, if you have good winds it's easy, but otherwise be ready to start engines. Uh, also a good method is to start the engines uh, early, so just start them and you know, keep them running uh, just for the safety. But well, we're good for now, so we'll uh, wait. So we are gonna squeeze through here. You probably do want to hand steer in these situations because the autopilot might be too slow, too lazy and you're gonna lose the height uh, for no reason. So now at this point, uh, I'm approaching this uh, narrow channel. So now I really wanna sail upwind. So I tension my channel, I'll do a little bit more. And because I wanna gain some uh, reserve. See, there's an island down there. The winds might change in a second. I'm still deep, I have 13 meters of water. Uh, see, I'm kind of upwind. But I really want to gain some uh, reserve. So later I can use it if the winds change. So you see now the boat speed is only five. And you have to turn the wheel a lot and quickly, especially in the catamarans. Otherwise not much happens. So now the biggest danger is, you know, the wind shifts too much and I will be pushed to that island. And then here you can see it's like very gusty, no winds. So the hand steering is gonna be way better than uh, autopilot. And as I've said, you have to go like a lot quickly. Otherwise the boat, these boats uh, don't really react. So the boat in front of us is falling at Genoa. So that I would say it's probably a bad sign because there's no nice beds around here. So they might be in trouble or they think there's too much wind outside. It's Lagoon 52, otherwise pretty good boat. But we continue across to this and it seems like we're gonna make it through here. Okay, looks like uh, we made it. Now we're getting a little bit more waves. So we came through this part. We're still a little bit, you know, behind the land. So it's uh, confusing the wind a little bit. Otherwise, we're almost good to go directly to the vis which is a beautiful island and Mamma Mia, you know the movies Mamma Mia, it was actually filmed Mamma Mia too. It was filmed on Island Vis. That's where they filmed the movie. So our tactics for these crossings are as following. So we go to this bay, the chart got kind of crazy and just doesn't work. Uh, we'll have to reset, but we're now on autopilot, so we'll just reset. It still works kind of. Anyway, we go to this bay. So the question is now, and this red line, this is actually course or ground. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you're sailing, you're never going straight. See, you this is heading. So we think we're going straight, but actually we're going a little bit sideways also. So our direction is actually down there. So if you would be looking at this point, or heading is, well, you're not gonna arrive there. You're gonna arrive a little bit lower because the wind's gonna push you 
and also you know the wind makes some current so you're being pushed so on this bng you can have this red line which calculates this for you and you can see that the boat see the direction heading is different than this red line so what you want to do is point this line to where you want to go now another question is are the winds going to stay steady or they're going to turn see we have winds from here so the question is once you come here are the winds going to turn more down or they're going to keep you know going like this so if you're not sure you always want to you know keep some reserve so see let's make five degrees up you know it's very easy to go downwind it's hard to go upwind so initially it's kind of cool to go a little bit higher and then once you see how what the winds are doing you know you can start going more into the direction now a very helpful tool on this boat is uh, this uh, wind history you see this is going to tell you a lot about what the speed is doing the direction is doing now it's kind of messy because this is a one hour because we're going through all the islands and you know but in the end when you're sailing uh, with the day winds you will see that they're kind of shifting you know with the sun and when you're getting close to the island you could see the effect of the island so you'll see you know some wind shift Now trying to set the telltales of the Genoa, but as I've said, self-taking, it's just impossible. So you see on the top, it's kind of okay, all the way on the top, it's already kind of too open. But these guys are saying I should release more. So you just do a compromise and look for the speed and like, it's how it is, but you know, far from, I would be happy. Now with the mainsail, what we did initially is, uh, we released more the main sheet. So having the main sheet released more, we get more twist on the top, which means the boom goes up and opens on the top. So you're like letting more air out, it's less efficient. But this is like the technique you can use when you have too much sail and you still don't want to reef. So you can, you know, like let the air out. But now because the winds uh, have dropped, we want to have more power. Now I'm going to tension the main sheet. I'm going to pull the boom down and then the upper part is going to close, giving us uh, more power. Okay, main sheet, so I'm gonna tension it and you can see behind. Okay, so let's look a look what we've done. Yeah, you can see obviously the upper part is now much more closed, has a better shape, it's more efficient. And that's what we were looking for. Now the speed, well, we're still doing around six knots but also the wind dropped, you see. So basically in less wind, uh, we are faster. So this is good. And this should be like this because we just made a big uh, change on the main, making it way more efficient. And it's working. The wind uh, picked up again. So it's kind of good that we kept uh, one reef in the main. And now, uh, what happened uh, to the wind regarding the land effect. So it happened exactly like uh, we were thinking. So the wind is blowing like this, but then it went a little bit more like, see like this. So we had around uh, up to 45 apparent wind angle, now we have 62. And uh, so yeah, there is this uh, island effect, uh, which is kind of sucking the wind, you know. So these are the things uh, you can expect you're never sure how it's gonna be, but it's just something, you know, to look for and to expect. So this is the wind history. You can see the wind was dropping the speed and then suddenly comes back, you know, in uh, like 20 minutes. And then the direction, you see how quickly it's changed. And now it's, you see, the angle is falling, uh, which means that the wind is, see, it's turning more and more like this alongside uh, the island. And we have the speed back, so we are back on 20 knots of true in speed, doing seven knots. So yeah, luckily, I mean, we could still do, do full sails, uh, but very quickly today we could get 25, 30 knots. So having one reef uh, was smart thing to do today. So we are back to Vis on the buoy, and this time we took a brand new rope on the buoy, so no problems, you know, no less trouble. And just using the same technique again. So when we came in, we first use uh, see this line and we brought the loop very close uh, to the beam. 
and then we had enough time you know to put the side lines and then we released the middle one so that the side lines are taking over and then again at night if it's very calm we can just tension the middle one so that the buoy wouldn't be crashing into the sides or these lines you know rubbing against the dinema almost packed now yeah i'll have to pull this is the i see lazy jack lines they go up they're holding this lazy jack and you can see this one needs to be tensioned a little bit so we'll have to lift this one and you can do this here on the mast and then it's gonna stand nicer so basically these lines they go up to the mast and down so it's very easy to adjust to the right tension so this is the lazy jack line you see it goes up and down so when i pull this one see it goes up and then you just uh, set the right tension it's a little bit low now entrance to the underground this is a great cave here and there's actually a secret uh, this is like the main route but then if you know where to go you go here and you can see out but then you want to go down here this, this is really hard to squeeze through very 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 narrow a little bit too big for this and then you get here this is a secret beach And you can swim out from here and swim in. That's the beautiful cave. There's some light coming in. I think it's just beautiful. Now the real demonstration of using these red fenders. I think it's just not looks good. I think it also are very functional. So now if you want to have the thin ones, it's not going to work so well. But these, uh, see, like round ones, they keep the bigger distance, and it's uh, very helpful when you leave your dinghy, you know, hitting the dock. I think it's really good. And aesthetically, I would say it's good. Now the blue one in front, you can see that. When the boat hits uh, the dock, like directly. So when thing goes directly, you see it's still gonna hit into the fender. Uh, so it's gonna protect a little bit uh, this area. We run a buoy in the Vis Harbor. So down there you have Kut, Island Vis. The boat is down there. Here's our dinghy. And then the Vis uh, town down there. So just look at this beautiful creation of water, you can see to the bottom, it's as clear as it gets. Because you don't want to be this guy, you see, making a very short line and then the dinghy keeps banging into the pier all the time. You know, it's away and it's going to crash. And then as soon as some waves will come, it's going to be just crashing, crashing. If the waves are going to be big because it's very short line, it's just going to pull him like crazy. And then when you have this line rubbing against the, the, the rubber or the PVC, eventually it wears out. So you don't want to be this guy, right? And uh, here's another dinghy. This one is high field, just like ours. And you see, you don't want to be this guy, you see. This boat is now just rubbing and you can see all the way around this rubber, it's all damaged because, you know, nobody cares for this dinghy. And they just leave it and then it's just banging into the pier. And you see, just by adding a couple of these fenders, everything is better. See how nicely it works, keeping the distance. And you always want to have a long line so if the big waves do come you know the boat can move another thing is when you have a lot of boats here again you want to have a long line so when people are you know squeezing in they can move your boat and you can fit uh, you know more boats so anyway 
you always want to have a long line and the fenders. And here's also a great demonstration how my carabine works so great, you see, like here. I can just hook it and I'm good to go. Or I can wrap it around here. It's all good. And I just hook it to this uh, Dynamo, which is used for lifting the boat. So just hook it here. And uh, it's just perfect. You always want to have a long line when you have a dinghy behind, because if there's waves, you know, the longer line is more stretchy, the dinghy is going to suffer uh, much less. So this uh, seems to be just like a perfect distance and combination. And it's so easy and it works. And the dinghy is not going to go away. Back to the nicest place in Croatia, I would say. Well hidden from the crowds. Uh, beautiful water. Very hard to anchor here. Our boat is down there. And just look at this. Uh, like it's it's the spot. I'm very lucky that it's hard to anchor here and not many people know this place. And we're kind of keeping it this way, I'm sorry. And just another perfect bay here on far. We are uh, tied to the buoy. And down there, one of the best restaurants around here, Gego. Uh, just a beautiful area to explore. And this beautiful bay has a beautiful restaurant. It's a Gego restaurant, family run. I've been coming here for years. Like really good homemade food. So this place is called uh, Zarače, Gego restaurant, and you should definitely come here. They have really, really good stuff, and you have the best view. Like this is just the place, uh, like you have to come. Another example why you should have fenders for the dinghy. See, like locals, they would have a small mooring line. Now we have these fenders and you can see this is very sharp uh, pier and you would just, you know, damage your dinghy. But these two guys are now doing their job. Now, again, you don't want to be this guy. See, it's from the other boat. They just came, they have loads of rope, but no fenders. And this poor dinghy is just going to crash into this sharp pier all the time. So yeah, you don't want to be this guy doing this. Get some fenders. This is one of the best octopus salads you can get yeah. uh, in Croatia, right. in Gego restaurant. Seafood spaghetti in Gego. Fish, and this is the fish plate for two. This is kind of cool because you get also the shrimps and the calamari. And this is some uh, zucchini side dish. Really, really good. Now, if you're a fan of the meat, this is like a really good mixed grill plate or just have these chicken sticks, really good stuff. This is the best panna cotta you would ever have, like with a caramel, like how it's shaking. And this is really, really good. You can have a version with uh, chocolate, but I suggest the caramel is the way to go. Beautiful morning. This is like a typical Croatian morning. It's calm. The water is like, it's like glass. You can see through, look at how clean it is. There's the restaurant where we ate yesterday. So how did we tie to the buoy here? So we're using just a middle and there's a reason. So we can see really well now there's a block, which is not a really big one. So in high winds, uh, we would probably just pull. There's actually two blocks connected. And then there's a rope buoy and this. Now this uh, bay is very specific because at night you get very strong, these catabatic bura winds and they come from all directions. And then, you see, you get wind from here, the boat gets pushed here. And then it gets pushed here, and it gets pushed forward. So all the direction, very strong gusts. Oh, look at the fish there, just going in a circle. Oh, that's so cool. So if the boat goes forward, so if you have these lines, you know, double like this and double to the other cleat. Then if the boat goes forward, it's going to pressure on the Dinema line, which can break it, it's not good. So that's why we only put it on the small one. Now, on the small one, you see, uh, it can handle like certain amount of pressure, 
actually quite a lot, but you get crazy noises, which is the same if you would have on these ones. Now we cannot really use this because the boat can go forward. So it's like kind of a very tricky, what can you do? So we could use uh, that uh, rubber shock absorption uh, thing you put on the rope, you know, it would make it a little bit better. So one solution would be to take one line here, you know, like on this cleat, like, and one that one, and then take from the back of the boat one line to the shore. Now that's all good until somebody goes over your line at night. Now there was more boats in the bay, and it's a very small one, so you could have, you see, more buoys, and when you have those, you know, winds, the boats can turn like independently, no, no logic, so they can kind of hit. So it would be a good idea, you know, to take the line there and mark it well so nobody, you know, goes over. Now, there's also an option of the, you know, extra anchor, which we don't really use in Croatia much. So we could take our spare anchor and just drop it somewhere there and tie it behind. And then, uh, you know, the boat would be kind of more stable. Now, what we've done today is we have used just the, another buoy because there was the free buoy behind us. So there's the buoy. So we have tied the rope here and another rope on the other side. So we kind of, you know, stabilized uh, ourselves. Now what I was thinking actually, we could just release the front line and just use these ones and be, you know, like the other way around. So the stern upwind, uh, it might make a little bit noises here, but if there's no waves, it just might work uh, really well, so we'll give it a try. Because there's no Dynema lines, you know, nothing to crash. You do have to look for the propellers, actually, because there's a propeller. So if you would be super unlucky, if these lines are too long, they could go under, hook the propeller. Uh, anyway, there is no, like, straightforward solution, because each boat is different, and uh, each bay has different winds characteristics, especially in Croatia, because the winds keep sh uh, shifting a lot. So these are just the ideas that, uh, you know, you can think about them, use them, and then make your life easier. Another thing is these buoys, if they're too loose, they start banging into the hull. So they're not soft, so when they start touching the hull, you're not gonna slip. So it's actually quite tricky to tie a catamaran to the buoy uh, that uh, you would have a comfortable night. Just look at this bay, this is beautiful. We are in Anjolta uh, Marina Maslnica. Very lucky today because the winds are very light. So we're gonna reverse uh, in here to this uh, Lagoon 42 catamaran. This is a very easy uh, marina. So the first thing I wanna check where the wind is coming is from there. So that's why we're gonna do this line first. You always wanna do the line going uh, upwind first. And there's a guy on the dock, he's going to pass us a mooring line and you don't want to get this in a propeller. So yeah, it's actually super easy today. I'm just going to turn the boat, go in, do the lines, not much to go wrong today, luckily. So very important to have these fenders on the back of the boat, uh, especially when you have a nice uh, pier like this. So you can just bounce on it, you know, it's really like essential, especially here, because I don't see much, you know, I don't see exactly what's happening down. Uh, basically, the most dangerous thing is that if somebody falls in the water, I have a camera here, but I might not see him, might run over him. Anyway, easy today. So this mooring line is attached to the pier and then goes out to the concrete block and uh, it's going to hold us away from the pier. Uh, but you have to be careful, it's very easy to get it in the propeller. And that's another reason why you want to have... Uh, uh, well, have, have fenders on the back, because these fenders will, you know, bounce us in case this mooring line gets too close to the uh, propeller.
Okay. Yeah. So now fixed the back lines. So very easy today because see we have these fenders on the back, so the boat is just gonna bounce. So no worries. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna get the mooring line. We'll have two. Yeah, just so keep pulling. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. I mean, I, I uh, it is, uh, it's easy, but it's, yeah. I know it's for the first time, it's kind of doesn't make much sense. Yeah, there's a big block. Comfort block and then uh, keeps us away. So it's essential when you have this mooring line that you don't pull it because you can get a propeller. You have to do this. You have to like walk it when you get to the fender, just go under. See some people do this. No, just go like this. And I'll keep pulling and keep dropping it in the water. And it's essential to uh, not have it hanging from the boat because when you're going to be leaving, it might get stuck in a propeller. So now again, you want to have a distance at least two meters in the back of the boat. No break your back. Check now the distance behind. Okay, so now I'm checking if there's anything uh, I'm gonna hook because I'm gonna reverse, uh, but always make sure there's no lines. So I'm just gonna put it in a gear. So I'll put it in a gear and then see how close we get. Okay. And now, because I'm in the reverse, the moorings are tangent. More pressure on the lines. Okay, excuse me. A little bit more here. Okay, now I'm putting the engines in the neutral. Uh, let's see. Now the distance is important that we can put a plank. Uh, so we can see that the plank is not gonna go very nicely here. It's because of the rope, so we'll have to put it on the other side, which means uh, we need to get closer. So you get closer like this. So we put a uh, boat reverse again. Just keep it in the gear. And uh, then I'm gonna release the mooring line just a little bit. So I can say like I want this much. So I just release this much. And then I check behind was the new distance. 
And I'll go a little bit more. It's always best to go little by little. Uh, easier than then. Incorrect. Okay. Tension this line again. Just keep taking the slack off a bit more. Yeah, we want to have the good distance for the for the for the board. Okay. Okay, so it looks like it's perfect, so you can stop the engines. Oh, thanks. Well, that was easy, no wind. And I'm gonna now, because the boat is now a little bit like this, I'm gonna also release the mooring lines on the other side, just to correct. So still have my engines reverse. You can see how big the distance is here. So I'll just go a little bit. Okay. And then tension again the line in the back. Now this angle in the back could be better, but it's how it is. Oh yeah, okay. Stop the engines. Yeah, we are docked here. So this is one of the easiest marina, you know, no wind. There's a boat you can lean on. Even easier would be like with two boats, you just squeeze between. And then you have to just pass the lines. See, we have these fenders in the back. Uh, so it's super easy, even because I don't see anything if I mess it up, so the corners are protected. So you just lean on the dock, you know, nothing goes wrong. Just make sure you don't get anything in the propeller and you'll be good. Now in the stronger winds, if we had winds from this side, it would be still, you know, kind of easy because there is a boat and there's a good dock. So once you have two, you know, good sides, you can just lean on them, you know, and then figure it out. Now the, the, the challenge with these boats is that, you know, I'm up there and you do have cameras here, but they're kind of useless. And I mean, you kind of bring the boat in, you can, with time, you kind of get the idea, you know, of the distance, like with a car, because you don't see the front, but with time, you just learn how long it is. Uh, the challenge is that you don't see what's going on here, so how people are handling the ropes. And somebody might throw it, is it like attached, is it not attached, is there an issue? That's something that you don't know, right? So, if you have, a, you know, just an amateur crew doing this just like once every few years, so you cannot expect them to, you know, have experience, right? So, this is a big challenge, especially in the strong winds, you know, and I'm mostly concerned for the safety of the crew. Because, you know, they try to do the best, you know, but you don't want them to get hurt. You know, their hands are uh, back or whatever. So, in a very difficult situation, I would probably just avoid, you know, these things. I would go for the anchor or the buoy or whatever. Uh, yeah, you don't want to do any challenging, uh, you know, 30 knots winds with this kind of boat and, uh, you know, amateur crew. You would need at least one very, you know, capable crew member who knows exactly what to do and then, uh, you know, uh, it would be way easier. Now, uh, let's say... Uh, let's say on the Lagoon uh, 42, Lagoon 42 is the one just uh, next to us. It's, you know, it's not much smaller boat, but you can see that the sitting position, uh, you, it's very visible, everything is really visible. And this boat is uh, like, I like this boat for maneuverability and for the, you know, you can see everything. Also here, when you're sitting up there, you don't see what's going on if somebody falls in, you know, you don't have like control over the, you know, what's going on the boat. Like this boat has much better, it's much better for, you know, family, for kids or something. 
you can see better and also when docking so you can see clearly what's happening you know what's going on with the ropes so this boat is way 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 easier uh, to maneuver the 42 than the 46 the same problem with the uh, lagoon 50 and then you know all the bigger boats have these issues now the the previous the 450 uh, it had kind of the you could open this uh, you know top somehow and then you could see you know much better the corners and also the the throttles were on the side so that boat was like the same size it also had fly bridge but so much easier you know to dock so they kind of messed it because it's in the middle so you really don't see anything so the throttles you know they should be here on the side so that i could be you know sitting here and kind of you know i could kind of have a better idea at least see one end and then if there was kind of the opening or you know whatever you could much easier uh, see what's going on at least like they could just put throttles on this side you know and then you would see at least you know one part of the boat it would make life uh, much easier our neighbors leaving and then we're gonna leave So now we're gonna go now let's check the winds so the winds are from the side so this can be tricky now because we don't have the boat here the things get a little bit more difficult because otherwise because we would be pushed here and there's another monohull on this side you know we could just release the ropes and just go out you know lean on them uh, but now if we release all the ropes we're just gonna you know swing down to that boat so now it's all about the sequence of the ropes so obviously these two ropes upwind are more important than the ones that are going uh, downwind. So the sequence would go, I always like to start with the mooring lines first, because they're more like tricky and make sure they're in the water. So we're gonna release uh, that one. Then we're gonna take uh, away this line. And now this is the upwind side. And then we're gonna put this one off. So we have only one line left, which is this one. This is the last, the most important one. Because this line is upwind, the wind is from the side. If I put engines forward, you see, I'm just gonna swing towards upwind, towards this boat, uh, which is, you know, helps me a lot. And then we have enough time to put this off, make sure everything is set. And then just, you know, having engines forward, being on that rope, uh, we might get close to this monohull, but anyway, once we start going out, See, the winds are gonna push us down, so it's not a problem. And that's how we stay away from this yacht, which we don't wanna damage. So this is the last line. And the same thing goes for if we would be coming in, this would be the first line. So once you attach this line and fix it, even with very strong winds from the side, just put your engines forward and you're gonna control the boat, you know, and have plenty of time for the other ropes. So it's always, you know, the sequence is very important. So we're gonna do a mooring line downwind, back line, downwind off then uh, this mooring line engines forward make sure everything is good double check you know nobody's going out no swimmers and then when you're ready the guy on the back is going to release that line and we're just going to go immediately out quite a lot of throttle uh, because if you don't put enough throttle you're just going to go a lot sideways right so you really want to go out get some initial speed because then the boat has much less you know side movement uh, if you have speed uh, forward now the faster you go, the better, but the faster you go, the more you crash if there's something, right? So something in between. Definitely don't go slow, because then you won't make it, but too fast, you might risk uh, big damages in case you mess it up and crash in some boat, like, but we're good now, because there's not many boats. So we have wind from there, right? So we want to get those lines off first. So we're going to do the front mooring line first. Make sure it's in the water. It's not hanging from, you know, from everywhere. Uh, then we're going to do the back line. That one goes with us, okay? And then on this side, we're gonna put this line off. No, this is the third line. And then this one is gonna have pressure. I'm gonna go slightly forward to keep the boat. So there is a pressure. So the person here has to be, maybe your mic will be here. And then, uh, so what we will do is, uh, so you will just, uh, let's go with some pressure, right? So just be careful when releasing. Yeah. And if uh, when we go out, you know, just release and, uh, you know, let it out. It's not going to go in a propeller because we're moving forward, right? And then bring it up. Yeah. Okay, so. It'll be here. Jack forward. 
So the first thing is before you go out, you always triple check there's nothing on the propellers. And then before you go out, always check if this is working as it should. So you check forward, okay? You check backwards, the boat actually has to move. Sometimes one cable breaks and then whatever you do, you will heal the engine, but it's not gonna switch the gear. So whatever you do, you're gonna go forward. So that's why you check, uh, like literally looking uh, if the boat moves and everything is correct, okay? Are we ready to release the mooring line? Yeah, let's release the mooring line. And at the same time, we can do the back line, bring it on board. I will wait with this one for a second until these ones are... Okay, now drop it. Very good. So now I'm already slightly having one engine forward, you know, to counteract the wind. And you can see the boat is moving forward, actually like upwind. I'm back in neutral. Yeah, let's release the other mooring line. Done, we can release this one. Then drop it in the water. So once we release this one, I really have to go a little bit forward with the engines because the wind is gonna push my bow down. So now we're on the single line. And now it's going you know, forward, I can actually push the boat upwind. And then, Mike, you ready? Yeah. Okay, let's release and go. So now Mike is gonna release, like the more the wind, the more, the more power I have to put on the engines. It's released. Ah, I can hear it dropped in the water. So here's this problem I don't see really well. So now I give it a push and then stop. You wanna get initial speed and then you're watching, if, if you're not sure, you can put neutral. But because you gave initial push, you're still moving out, but the propellers are not turning. So that's why it's good to give initial push. Make sure the mooring lines are okay. So now you can see the issue was, you know, making sure everything is good in the back because I don't really see, you know? So that's the tricky thing of this camera. So just listen, try to communicate. Okay, and we're good. We're gonna have a good sailing day. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Marina Maslinica Martinez Marchi, how is it called? I have to say always, this is, like I would say, maybe the best marina in Croatia. It's, it's not just it's beautiful, it's nice, like docks are good, everything is okay. Uh, the crew working here is really helpful. Uh, I really like coming here. The reservations are good, so this is just like, it's all here, you know, it's beautiful, they help you, it works. Uh, very motivated stuff, uh, everybody's nice, which is sometimes not the case in all the marinas. So I definitely recommend uh, this place. And this has been like this for the last 10 years and uh, like they keep the standards uh, really well. So thumbs up for this marina. Okay, so it's time to start sailing and today I'm gonna put my gloves up. I always talk about gloves, but never have them. So I'll be a good example. So I have sent, uh, set uh, wind autopilot upwind. We have uh, 12 knots of true in speed. So I have to put enough power in the engines that the autopilot can handle to have authority over the boat. If there's not enough speed, you know, the, boat, the winds will play with the boat, so just put enough. Your life is going to be easier. Now we have already opened the, the back, the line that holds the boom left and right. So more things should be, you know, set. Now we have this uh, small line. And this small line is used when you're putting the sail down. But going up, you must make sure uh, that, uh, you know, it goes nicely. So just preset it. These things are usually tangled. Uh, well, I guess they shouldn't be, but you know, that's the real life. So just make them uh, nice. I draw them down here and hook. I'm gonna uh, put this boom in the center. On the traveler, I'm gonna release the main sheet uh, like slightly, but then I'll do more uh, later. Now the boom lift is set correctly, which means now it's not hitting the roof, but then when I leave the sail, it's gonna be loose. So if you set it correctly, uh, you're like, uh, you know, no need to worry. But make sure that somebody didn't play, see more spaghetti. That's how it is on the boat. You know, things always get uh, tangled, although they shouldn't, I guess. Now I'm gonna open, uh, Stopper, this red one is the main halyard. 
and we hook it here so it doesn't make noise. And then immediately, I'm already pulling it down because sometimes it gets kind of hooked if you leave it too loose for too long. Taking the slack out here. Now this is a great example how the things get tangled, you see? You don't even know. And then you break, you see? So this has to be aligned. You can have these uh, coils which hold it up. Uh, so this is not the best. So once the sail is, you know, ready for hoisting, you double check there's no boats, nothing, and all these uh, safety things. Now, I recommend going just by hand for the first couple meters. So I put one donut around the winch, and I could keep the stopper open, although I could keep it closed because it's, uh, you know, it goes this way, but not the other one, but much less friction because I'm using my muscles and I don't want, you know, more friction. Okay, everything is good. Now, the challenge is getting the buttons. These are these, uh, like, sticks in a sail, not get hooked to the lazy jack, which are all these, you know, gray ropes. So that's why I go by hand, and it's much uh, quicker. Sometimes even, see, like, just like directly in a winch, and then I can control it better. And it's way faster. See, if you're using a latching winch at this point, you're not getting any exercise, and it takes ages. So once it gets hard, close the stopper. I put everything on the winch, plenty of donuts. Uh, the first three buttons are usually problematic. They get hooked to the uh, lazy jack. Now I have to watch the reefing lines on the back. They love to get tangled or under the boom. And the boom lift, it's the line on the back holding the boom up. I need to get sail from one side, you know, not like uh, crisscrossing it. So that's uh, two things I'm watching. You see, it's up. You see, it messed it up. The wind is playing a little bit. Then I just have to wait for uh, a better moment. You see, now I have to go a little bit down. Okay. So I have to catch the right moment. Now uh, is this one, you see, again, the third one is hooked. So, you know, sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you have to play a little bit more, but definitely don't force it. See, putting up and down, almost messed. You need to have a really nice one, not crossing. Okay, looking good. So you have to keep it from one side of the boom lift. I'm checking the reefs, if they're going nicely, not getting tangled anywhere. You can see all the spaghetti in the back. They all usually like figure out, or well, maybe won't today, so I'll go there and pull them a little bit. See, so not today. Usually when you film, everything goes kind of wrong, uh, but that's good because that's why we're filming, right? Maybe we won't pause this one. So I'll go down a little bit, just to sort out these reefs. So it's just a small fix, but you have to be careful, you know, watching this. And now they could go under the boom, you see? Let's hope we're lucky, okay? Now at this point, I open the main, uh, main sheet, because when tangenting the sail, it shouldn't be uh, tangent. And then I go little by little. Now, how much tension? The sail must have a nice shape. And more wind, more tension, it's just like, uh, I just do it by sound, by feeling. But very important, if you don't tension this much enough, and the sail in strong winds kind of stretches, go down a little bit, you're gonna have this uh, kind of 
line the sail is kind of you know, deformed and then eventually deforms the sail. So always keep on uh, enough pressure. But then again, don't overdo it, you know, because then you'll see another thing is this line is kind of stiff. So it just goes here. Just make sure it doesn't go in a propeller because obviously it's, it's not good, right? Okay. Now I've stopped it, so this is good. And I'm gonna put the... Now you can coil this in figure eights. You can do all kinds of stuff with these ropes. Uh, what I figured out is, just take it as this, put it in. Like some people might complain. Uh, actually the best would be, you know, to put it very nicely in. Uh, but like I know, but it's perfect, you know, like in these conditions you can afford this. If it's really like, you know, bad conditions, then you would prepare it a little bit better. But maybe not the best example, but it's the reality, you know, in nice weather. And then, uh, so I'm gonna do it like this and slowly turn uh, downwind. Now, I do have to keep my engines uh, running. Because these catamarans, just with one sail, uh, they're not very happy catamarans. I'm now releasing the traveler because we're gonna have winds from the side. And that also gives me less, you know, twist. You don't wanna have it too tangent then just turning you upwind. Uh, get kind of a direction. Okay, this would be. I mean, like this, I'm putting back autopilot. Now I check the wind and the angle, so we have 50 knots of true in speed. I was hoping to put out the big light Gen Genoa Code Zero, but just too much wind for today. So I'm now taking this small line, which is very fragile on this boat. We've broken it, it's not really good quality. We've broken it a couple of times, but anyway. So this line is the line furling when you're like closing the sail, but now obviously I have to, you know, release it to be able to open the sail. Now this is the sheet, this is this line. And when I pull this, it opens the, you know, the, the jib. So I open the stopper here. Uh, I have a little bit of control here, the more the wind, because you don't want to release this line because the sail will just go But initially, you know, you should be like, have just a little bit. Good to have gloves here. And now I'm controlling the opening with a small line. Okay, this is pretty nice. I close the stopper and I always keep a slight tension on this one so it doesn't fall off the drum. Now let's put these engines off. We don't really like this sound. Well, they say, you know, when you stop, you should like, you know, wait like a little bit. I don't think anybody really does that, especially when renting the boat. And these engines still go forever. This is Yanmar. Like basically whatever you do with them, they're happy. Really, really good. Uh, so now the direction is set. I'm now using the heading, not wind autopilot, because we really want to go there, right? So the boat is just keeping the direction. And let's set the sails. So let's go Genoa first. I'm looking at the telltales. Okay, looking good. The main is actually looking good. We have winds a little bit from behind, impaired wind from 90. And I think uh, we're sailing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Wait, just a second. So this is Cooper, he's my cameraman. Yes. It's Cooper, like the Cooper Island, you know, BVI, British Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. He has that shirt. Super <laughs> yeah. nice to have him on board this week. So we can film a little bit more of, uh, you know, this stuff. Yeah, okay. exciting. Thank you. Now it's nice to have also more bags, like more storages for the ropes. So the best thing is to do this. So you just put it in. Now it would be good to have like a dedicated you know, box for the rope. That's what you would have in racing boats.
Now there's obviously like more methods, I guess somebody's gonna say this is not right or this is better. It works, you know, try it. Don't listen to me too much, give it a try if you like it. It's more like important to know what you're doing and how you're using it. Now it's not about, it's about like mastering whatever technique you have. So now if we get in trouble and I want to release this line, you know, very quickly it will just, you know, go, you know, very nicely. It won't get stuck. But as you've seen, this takes a lot of time and I think most of the people renting the boat, I don't think nobody's going to bother with this. You know, it's a reality. We're humans on vacations. So usually it's nice weather and then you don't expect, you know, any trouble. And then, you know, just before putting the sail down, you know, you kind of make it a little bit nice. Sometimes it gets tangled as you go down, which, you know, it shouldn't, but that's how it is. If it gets tangled, always close the stopper untangle, you know, and then open, it's just like, so you're not holding it and trying to untie. Anyway, nobody's perfect, but there's good methods, fast methods, and all kinds of methods. Winds are picking up, which is how the day winds are, and it's even better for us. Now we're doing, you see, seven knots, like easily, just gliding, 60 knots of true wind speed. We were doing 7.5 earlier. It's just perfect conditions, you know, when you have winds from here, 16 to 20 knots, full sails. This is where these catamarans really like uh, sailing, especially on the smooth sea. So I just could say this is like probably the best sailing day in this season.